Уважаеми колеги, уважаеми говорители, скъпи гости, позволете ми да открия днешната среща, като благодаря на всички вас за това, че сте тук. Днешната среща събира повече от 130 парламентаристи от всичките държави членки на Европейския съюз. Бих желал да отправя личните си благодарности към Клод Мораес за неговата пряка ангажираност и подготовката за днешната среща в контекста на парламентарното измерение на българското председателство. Първата си работна среща с господин Клод Мораес проведохме след учредителното събрание на съвместната група на парламентарния контрол през октомври 2017 година в Европейския парламент в Брюксел и от тогава работим съвместно в търсене на консенсус за най-ефективният начин, по който да бъде организирана работата на групата. За това благодаря на него, на екипа му, на секретарията на ЛИБЕ, на господин Диес Демера и колегите от главна дирекция председателство на Европейския парламент за работата и подкрепата. Член 88 от договора за функциониране на Европейския съюз от Лисабон предоставя безпредседента по рода си форма за надзор на дейността на Европол. Като регламентира този политически надзор, като споделена отговорност между Европейския парламент и националните парламенти. По време на естонското председателство се проведе очредителната среща на работната група по парламентарен контрол, но за съжаление тогава не се умяхме да постигнем съгласие по приемането на процедурните правила и оставихме това решение за днешната среща поради резерви от тевет национални парламент. Тук искам да им благодаря, че към днешна дата след проведените двустранни консултации те принципно подкрепят постигнатият компромис. В рамките на изтеклите месеци с екипа на господин Мораес работихме усърдно за постигането на консенсус затова апелирам отново към вашата подкрепа и конструктивност за следващия панел. Нека на днешната среща, нека вземем това историческо решение, което смятам, че е ключово и изключително важно, за да може да се осъществява необходимият парламентарен контрол върху дейността на Европол. Останалите тематични акценти в днешния ден вред засягат сътрудничество с Западните Балкани, защото трябва да получим всичко, заедно, усилята тези страни да имат едно сигурно бъдеще и да запазят евроатлантическата си ориентация, означава много за всички нас. Радвам се, че темата за Западните Балкани намира място като акцент в работата на Европол, в документите на многогодишното програмиране. Това показва, че агенцията е стратегически ориентирана с поглед към бъдещето. Тук искам да благодаря на Европол, на Роб Лайнрайт, на неговия екип за активната роля за постигането на тези цели. След предизвикателствата, които ще обсъждаме, днес централно място взема киберсигурността в ерата на дигитализацията и онлайн услугите, както и борбата с тероризма и организираната престъпност, които са свързани с гарантиране сигурността онлайн и неутрализирането и организирането на незаконното съдържание в интернет пространството. Благодаря на комисарите Мария Габриел и Кинг за техния принос към днешния дебат. Уважаеми колеги, смятам, че днешния ден действително ще постигнем това, за което сме се събрали. И преди да дам думата на съпредседателя Клод Мораес, бих искал да кажа някои думи, които са свързани с чисто организационната работа. Днес, понеже при този натоварен дневен ред, почивка не е предвидена, освен обяда, който ще направим от 13.15 до 14.15, но по време на целият дебат, който ще водим, в което ще има възможност всеки един, който прецени, че се нужда от определена подкрепа, кафе и малко сладкиши, да знае, че действително ще може да разчита и в което по всяко време ще има отворен бюфет. Искам също така да израза начина по който ще се взима думата. Тук искам да кажа, че 
картите изискане на думата, които се намират в папките на всеки делегат, моля да ги попълните и да ги предадете на колегите на обозначените места в лявата част на залата. Думата ще се дава по реда на получените заявки. Тъй като поради на... Аз се възползвам от случая да дам думата на съпредседателя Клод Морайс, да му благодаря за тази екипна работа, която направихме през последните месеци и благодаря на всички делегации, които днес са тук в София, за да можем действително да вземем историческите решения. Благодаря ви. Thank you very much, Svetan. Um, and let me underline uh, the thanks that you have given to uh, the members of the national parliaments here and the members of the European Parliament for all the uh, close cooperation which has brought us to this important second meeting of the Europol Joint Parliamentary Scrutiny Group. So, dear co-chair, thank you to you personally uh, for all the hard work and, of course, for hosting us in this uh, magnificent setting. Thank you very much. So, dear colleagues, dear guests and speakers, it is with great pleasure that we welcome you to this meeting, co-organised, of course, by the Bulgarian Parliament uh, and the European Parliament. As I already mentioned during um, the dinner yesterday, we're very happy that more than 75 national parliamentarians are here today, representing 27 EU member states, as well as nine members of the European Parliament. Today's debates will start with, first of all, an exchange of views and hopefully the adoption of the rules of procedure for our scrutiny group. Second, we will discuss past and future cooperation of Europol with the Western Balkan countries. Third, we will have an exchange of views on the 2020-2022 Europol multi-annual work programme with Rob Wainwright, the executive director of Europol. Next, we will also hear from Mr. Parkna, the chairperson of the Europol Management Board. We will then see a video message by Mr. Buttarelli of the European Data um, Protection uh, Organization, and we will discuss matters regarding data protection with Mr. Vierovsky, the EU Data Protection Assistant Supervisor. And then after our lunch, kindly again provided by our Bulgarian colleagues and hosts. We will have a family photo um, and we will then continue our sessions. Um, and for the family photo, notoriously, people are often late for this photo. I have been missing from many family photos. So please, please organize yourselves for the family photo and please be, be ready for this uh, photograph, which I think takes place just outside the hall. So following the family photo, we will continue our sessions and then we will exchange views on countering illegal content online and optimising cyber security with Commissioners Gabrielle King and Europol Director Mr Wainwright. Um, and of course we are delighted to have um, our two Commissioners here and of course delighted again um, to hear uh, from our Europol Director Mr Wainwright. Mm -hmm. Then finally colleagues, um, we will hear about Europol's contribution to the fight against terrorism and the prevention of organised crime. And in saying this final point, could I underline at the outset that today's meeting is about ensuring that we um, conclude the um, that we conclude the rules for Europol, and that we should do everything possible in our sessions today. Uh, to get to that conclusion so that Europol, the valuable agency that we all subscribe to, can carry out its work. So I do want to emphasise this at the end of uh, that summary um, of the work that we want to achieve today. So now um, we move on to the um, exchange of views and the adoption of the rules of procedure for the JPSG. Um, and here also, um, I would be joined by um, the, my Vice Chair, Mr. Diaz de Mera, um, who will also uh, join me. He is um, the European Parliamentarian who has been um, leading on this uh, subject for the European Parliament. So let me open this point um, with the permission of my co-chair and we 
begin um, with the with the background to this um, issue. Thank you. So, colleagues, um, in the constituent JPSG meeting in Brussels, we held interesting discussions on the draft rules of procedure. It wasn't possible to conclude on that occasion, as we all know, and we have had many discussions since that meeting. Mr. Eck, the JPSG co-chair at the time, and myself promised to consult all of you as national parliamentarians um, and to talk about the amendments that you put forward, and we have done this. Um, and with um, Mr. Svetanov, we have put forward new compromise proposals. So in the past week, Mrs. Svetanov and I have had intensive bilateral contacts with those delegations that had tabled amendments before the JPSG constituent meetings, and we have spoken to those of you who have expressed doubts or questions regarding certain points. Our bilateral meetings and contacts have shown that there is a very common determination to reach agreement on the JPSG rules of procedure. These contacts help clarify the main changes that were needed to find a common ground and a text that would reflect the needs and concerns of all JPSG delegations and members. Now, we have sent to you all the new compromise proposals on the 23rd of February, with a deadline for amendments set by the 12th of March, and we received comments from six delegations of JPSG parliaments, as well as a letter by the Danish parliament. So, colleagues, we are on the brink of a historic moment. It is the first time such rules have ever happened, and we are setting the rules and procedures for the first joint parliamentary scrutiny body ever established. You as national parliaments and for my colleagues in the European Parliament are working together to strengthen Europol and the security of our citizens. So now, before we open the debate, let me first give the floor to the seven delegations who submitted comments to the compromise proposals. Those seven were France, Germany, Sweden, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, and Denmark. So if I could begin, please. Um, actually, no, before I begin, um, yes, sorry, let me just begin with France. Um, first, if they could please take the floor. Oui. Oui, Monsieur le Président. C'est bon, oui. Chers collègues, euh, d'abord, je tenais à remercier euh, pour cette organisation depuis hier des travaux autour de ce, de ce sujet que nous travaillons depuis maintenant plus de quatre ans. Et pour les premiers qui ont travaillé sur ce sujet et qui ont souhaité finalement avancer sur un, un, un contrôle parlementaire. Je me souviens les premières réunions. Et il est important, je, je salue donc la volonté de nous retrouver aujourd'hui pour avancer. Le, notre objectif, chers collègues, aujourd'hui pour nous en France, c'est qu'on puisse sortir avec un premier projet de règlement intérieur. Et même s'il doit être amélioré, complété, et nous ne devons pas sortir avec, comme la dernière fois, avec, à remettre à plus tard ce que nous pouvons faire aujourd'hui. L'urgence est là. Il est nécessaire, compte tenu des défis que la, la France et je dirais même tous les pays de l'Union européenne, européenne connaissent en termes de sécurité, en termes de protection, c'est important finalement d'avancer tous ensemble. Et c'est pour cette raison-là nous avons, euh, on aura l'occasion au moment de, de débat sur les amendements, d'affirmer de, deux, trois sujets. D'abord, la question de, des partenaires. Euh, les questions des observateurs. Nous avons évoqué le, le sujet de la, du Danemark lors de la dernière fois. Euh, nous pensons qu'effectivement, au niveau du Danemark, nous devons euh, rester, effectivement, lui permettre d'être associé euh, comme observateur. Euh, C'est déjà un élément essentiel, important, mais je pense qu'il faut aussi euh, respecter le fait qu'il y ait une volonté exprimée par plusieurs États membres d'être plus actifs au sein d'Europol de, et donc euh, chacun pourra contribuer à son niveau. Et je pense que le deuxième élément que nous avons soulevé, c'est la question de la majorité qualifiée. Nous aurons le débat un peu plus tard. 
Euh, le texte qui nous a été proposé, c'est un bon compromis. Et, et c'est un compromis qui nous permet justement d'avancer. Et de, le dernier élément, sans être plus longue, parce que je suis passé à ce niveau-là, je ne souhaite pas rester plus longtemps. Et il était essentiel aussi, nous avons une responsabilité en tant que parlementaires et représentants des différents membres de l'Union, mais également pour le Parlement européen, de, de faire en sorte que nous décidons en responsabilité et ne pas remettre finalement le choix euh, au président des assemblées parlementaires ou euh, aux, aux différents aux États gouvernements. Je crois que c'est aussi un acte de responsabilité parlementaire au moment où quelquefois nos institutions sont euh, touchées par des, par des populismes, euh, par ici ou par ailleurs, hein, au sein de l'Union européenne. Et je crois que ce groupe de contrôle d'Europol de, de permettra, le groupe parlementaire permettra d'avancer et permettre à Europol d'aller plus loin dans les besoins qu'il exprime. Aujourd'hui, pour être plus efficace sur les hotspots, pour être plus efficace sur les, sur les frontières. Nous aurons l'occasion tout à l'heure d'en parler. Voilà ce que je voulais dire, Monsieur le Président. Et je, je demande à ce que nous soyons vraiment responsables et avancer avec un premier règlement aujourd'hui, même s'il y a des choses qui peuvent être complétées plus tard. Merci. Thank you. And may I now give um, our colleagues from Germany the floor, please. Sehr geehrte Herren Vorsitzende, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die Einrichtung des gemeinsamen parlamentarischen Kontrollausschusses ist ein sehr bedeutender Schritt. Und wir stehen kurz vor der Verabschiedung der Geschäftsordnung dieses Gremiums. Der gestern übermittelte Entwurf stellt aus unserer Sicht eine gute kompromissfähige Grundlage für unsere Arbeit dar. Ich bedanke mich daher auch im Namen meiner Kolleginnen und Kollegen vom Deutschen Bundestag bei allen Beteiligten für die harte Arbeit in den letzten Wochen. Und ganz besonders möchte ich mich bei dem Co-Vorsitzenden für ihre Bemühungen bedanken, diese herausfordernde Aufgabe erfolgreich zum Abschluss zu bringen. Eine wirksame Kontrolle durch das neue Gremium setzt aus unserer Sicht voraus, dass das Kontrollgremium über ausreichende Informationen verfügt. Und vor dem Hintergrund hat sich der Deutsche Bundestag aktiv für eine Verankerung des Fragerechts der Mitglieder des Kontrollgremiums in der Geschäftsordnung ausgesprochen. Und dabei handelt es sich um eines der wichtigsten parlamentarischen Rechte. Eine effiziente Kontrolle setzt aus unserer Sicht voraus, dass dieses Recht permanent ausgeübt werden kann. Und deswegen haben wir dem Änderungsantrag eingereicht, der auf eine entsprechende Klarstellung abzielt. Wir sind der Auffassung, dass die nationalen Parlamente von ihrem Fragerecht verantwortungsvoll Gebrauch machen. Durch den Zulässigkeitsmechanismus im neuen Text können die Fragen in dieser Hinsicht auch strukturiert werden. Wir begrüßen auch die neuen Formulierungen zu den Aufgaben der Vorsitztroika, zur Einrichtung eines Sekretariats und zur Möglichkeit, bestimmte Themen erforderlichenfalls in Untergruppen zu behandeln. Der Deutsche Bundestag ist sehr daran interessiert, dass die Geschäftsordnung heute verabschiedet wird. Wir appellieren an alle Delegierten, den vorliegenden Kompromiss zu unterstützen, damit wir uns auf die inhaltliche Arbeit konzentrieren. So hätten wir auch mehr Zeit, um in den noch verbleibenden zwei Sitzungen bis zur Überprüfung der Geschäftsordnung im Herbst nächsten Jahres Erfahrungen mit der Umsetzung der Verfahrensgrundlage zu sammeln. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, im Namen meiner Kolleginnen und Kollegen vom Deutschen Bundestag bitte ich an, dass wir weiterhin konstruktiv am Aufbau einer permanenten und effizienten Kontrolle von Europol mitwirken. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much to our German colleagues and now the national parliamentarians from Sweden, please. Thank you so much. I will be very short. You have all seen the letter from us in which we highlight our opinions on the issue of the subgroups and the meaning of the, of the words in principle according to consensus. In the dialogue after that, we are satisfied with, which, with what we see now, and we think it's very important that we can adopt this today. And we would like to say a big thank you for all the hard work from the Swedish uh, Riksdag to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. And now we go to the national parliamentarians from Poland, our Polish colleagues. Messieurs, Madame, Delegue de Parlement National, nous sommes venus ici pour l'hospitalité de Sofia, le président Bulgarie dans l'Union européenne, afin qu'ensemble nous avons décidé 
que les efforts de chaque parti lieu à la sécurité des citoyens de nos pays et de toute l'Europe et les activités qui y sont associées en un sens et sont cruciales pour nous. Par conséquence, bien que déjà apporté de suggestions de la délégation polonaise, a précisé la façon dont nous devrions procéder dans le processus de prise de décision dans des cas exceptionnel et souligner la bonne expérience de les Tsossak et sa pratique compte tenu de l'importance des tâches d'Europol et l'espoir de la majorité de la délégation nous allons d'ici de Sofia avec la conclusion finale. Notre délégation inclinait la proposition présentée par le bureau de notre Assemblée. Nous supposons qu'il est préférable, au nom de la solidarité européenne, alors que la sensibilisation d'utilisation fréquente de structures criminelles fait que le manque de dynamisme suffisant et une synergie dans les activités de force de la police des pays européens. Reconnaissance que les questions des procédures pouvant être évaluées et en temps opportun, par exemple, dans l'année 2019, sont réservés d'analyse, à l'heure d'aujourd'hui, il est nécessaire d'accepter et de donner des activités univoques autour de l'Europol. Par conséquent, la Pologne travaille avec vous dans un certain nombre de pays européens pour prendre soin de leurs citoyens et de leur sécurité. En même temps, nous suggérons que nous considérions nos commentaires utiles lorsque, dans une deal d'un an, dans le processus d'évaluation des solutions adoptées, il serait reconnu que nos suggestions et solutions contribueraient mis à l'efficacité des activités de l'Europol à la sécurité des Européens. Nous soumettons et confirmons également la proposition de prévoir un réservé financier pour la traduction des documents d'Europol dans toutes les langues de l'Union européenne au plan budgétaire de l'Union européenne. Merci. Thank you very much to our Polish colleagues. And now for the delegation from Romania, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Zvetanov, Mr. Moraes, dear colleagues, we are very proud to be here. Uh, we want to thank uh, the Bulgarian colleagues for uh, organizing the event. Uh, we would like to thank you for the work and time in order to achieve a good and effective rules of procedure. We are very pleased to see the changes made in the rules of procedure. We achieved uh, good steps about subgroups, addressing que the right to address questions, presidential troika, and so on. So we have to, we hope that today we can have a vote. You can count on our support. Um, there are some things, maybe the right to address question is a little bit too general. But we understand that the presidential troika will have the task to set up the details. And uh, we are hoping that we will add that in the conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the uh, Slovakia National Parliament delegation, please. Merci beaucoup de paroles. Uh, uh, nous avons uh, seulement un petit amendement. Uh, nous voulons que uh, nous, nous demandons que tous les changements de ces règles en futur, il faut réaliser uh, par consensus. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And now, uh, finally, from those countries who submitted comments to the compromise proposal, we have Denmark. Dear colleagues, as chairman of the European Affairs Committee of the Danish Parliament, let me begin by thanking the co-chairs for the work you have done. 
trying to provide compromises on many different amendments. As you know, the Danish Parliament has submitted a number of am amendments to the draft rules of procedures, where the most important point for us is that Denmark should be a full member of the European Europol JPSG. As a joint parliamentarian scrutiny group to the Europol, the role of the national parliaments, in our view, is very important. As a member state of the European Union, we find clear support of the Danish view in the treaties and in the pre precedent from other intermentarian meetings. In all other intermentarian meetings between parliaments in the EU, there is a clear rule of including all parliaments despite national derogation from the legal framework. We are aware that there are di divergent views on this, and for that very reason, it will be difficult to find a satisfactory solution today. We do, we do not want this particular issue to stand in the way of the adoption of the rules of procedure. That is why we would accept the suggestion from the co-chairs to postpone the final decision on the Danish question and instead, instead establish a working group who will clarify the Danish parliament status within the Europol JPSG. The working group will consist of the presidential troika and representatives of the Danish parliament that will finalize its work at the latest by October 2019. Thank you. Thank you to our Danish colleagues. And of course, thank you to all the other um, colleagues from all the other national parliaments who had discussions with us um, since the last meeting also. What I'm going to do now, colleagues, is I'm going to, with the permission of uh, Mrs. Fatanov and uh, Mr. Diaz de Mera, is provide just a short summary of a response to those points and to where we are uh, on the question of the, um, the compromise. And following this, I will ask Mr. Diaz de Mera just to provide some additional comments. He is the Europol rapporteur, for those of you who are not aware of this, and um, is our expert on these matters. So I'll ask him to listen to my summary, and if he wishes to add any points, then um, I'd be very happy for him to do so. Um, so let me just summarise where we are, colleagues. First of all, to thank you for your interventions and to say that um, in response we have some key elements of the proposal which I think, um, having listened to you, we can accommodate all the concerns which have been expressed. In front of you, you have an updated version of the compromise. This version includes the comments made by the French and German delegations on the issue of written questions and the observations that can be included in the conclusions. The new text also reflects a strong role for national parliaments through the presidential troika in the agenda setting, the preparation of discussion documents, the secretariat and the drafting of the conclusions of the JPSG. It also gives delegations the possibility to effectively contribute to the agenda and the scrutiny findings. It guarantees and promotes the democratic right to parliamentarians and the fundamental principle of scrutiny, namely the right to ask questions during and in between JPSG meetings that of course need to be answered within a reasonable deadline by Europol. Specifically to our Romanian colleagues, we would like to repeat our commitment that guidelines on the written and oral questions procedure need to be set up. The presidential troika will need to take up this point as soon as possible. But the proposed system also warrants quality control and a workable scenario for Europol and its services. So these rules of procedure leave room for the JPSG's role to evolve and develop further. They foresee the possibility to set up subgroups and ensure the participation of all chambers and parliaments national parliaments in the scrutiny activity. To the Swedish delegation, we would like to reiterate that a discussion on the focus of such subgroups should be held. The presidential troika, giving political guidance to the JPSG, should take the initiative in this case. To our esteemed Polish colleagues, we understand your request and the importance of having a more open linguistic regime by Europol on providing documents such as the multi-annual policy programme. Mr. Svetanov and I will include a reference uh, to the point in the conclusion. And we understand that decision-making process is also part of the general review, which will take place um, following up to 
2019, October of 2019. And we thank our Polish colleagues for the further discussions we have had on this. Our proposal also deals with the issue of observers and the level of their involvement in the daily work of the JPSG. And then coming finally to the um, question, which we shall now call the Danish question, uh, regarding the Danish level of participation, I thank the colleagues for their um, uh, presentation just now. Mr. Spatanov, Mr. Christensen of the Danish delegation and I are happy to inform you that an agreement was reached that satisfies both parties. A paragraph will be included, a, a written paragraph will be included to our conclusions that a working group composed by the presidential troika and the Danish parliament will be set up to deliver recommendations ahead of the revision um, scheduled in October 2019. Mr. Svetanov and I are convinced that the proposed text is balanced and will ensure an active involvement of those member states that are no longer part of the Europol regulation, mirroring their level of participation in Europol. And I think this is important to all of us. All in all, this new compromise proposal also incorporates the main changes already agreed upon in our debates of the 9th and 10th of October 2017 as regards speaking time, the possibility to hold extraordinary meetings, the reporting by the JPSG representatives attending Europol Management Board meetings, the guaranteeing of the possibility of interpretation at meetings held in the presidency member states, and so on. We would also like to recall um, delegations uh, that are, or, or recall two delegations that a review of the rules of procedure by October 2019 is foreseen while respecting the principles set by the Speaker's Conference on decision making. In order to ensure an efficient and effective scrutiny, delegations will, however, have the opportunity to present amendments and annotations to draft, conclu to draft conclusions. We sincerely hope that you will support the progress that has been made, as most concerns, we believe, have been incorporated into this new text, resulting in a balanced proposal. Before um, I ask if any other delegations would like to take the floor or whether Mr. Svetanov would like to add anything, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Diaz de Mera whether he would like to make any additions to this uh, general summary. No, no. Okay. I think Mr. Diaz de Mera is indicating I've spoken long enough. That's long enough for the European Parliament. So, Mrs. Svetanov, would you like to add anything? Okay, I think I've exhausted everyone. Um, but I, do, I hope colleagues will bear with me because it's important to summarize all of the hard work that has taken place since the first meeting. Okay, where are we now? So, um, so now, oh yeah, now we've got to adopt it. So, um, okay, would any other delegation wish to take the floor? And my notes say that um, time is short. <laughs> Would anyone else like to take the floor before I uh, move on to the adoption? No? Okay. Who do we have? Cyprus, please. Good morning. We wish to express our satisfaction with this draft version of the rules of, of it incorporates the major concerns that were expressed in our first constituent meeting. We believe that this set of rules provides a solid framework within which the JPSG will be fully equipped to effectively exercise its mandate regarding the political monitoring of Europol as provided for in the regulation and the treaty. We would like to thank the co-chairs for the drafting of this balanced compromise text that we very much hope can be adopted today. Regarding proposed amendments, we believe that the amendment proposed by the German Bundeskat regarding the right to ask questions is a valid one, and we support it. The amendment proposed by our French colleagues is also supported, since we consider it will facilitate reaching consensus for the adoption of conclusions. The amendments proposed by the Polish Senate regarding the introduction 
of an additional qualified majority procedure will comp complicate decision making. We believe that constructive abstention would be the way to go. Our general view is that this issue should be referred back to the speaker's conference for clarification. Regarding the issue of language version of documents submitted of the JPSG by Europol, we believe that maintaining the practice of having English and French as working languages is practicable. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, ex I expected somebody to come in at the end there. Uh, let, let's, um, Belgian colleague, please. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Please allow us to congratulate you as well on this very uh, balanced text, balanced rules of procedure. Uh, I do believe that this is a very good and clear uh, compromise, especially also with our Danish uh, friends. I think that was one of the, the main issues. Uh, just one minor remark. Uh, I've uh, said this in the past as well. There is one typo still in the text, 4.1.e uh, and 4.3. Uh, we say uh, GSPG uh, instead of GPSG. That's, that was the only remark uh, I've stated uh, in the past. Okay, but uh, thanks again, and also we can agree upon this very balanced text, and we hope that our fellow colleagues will do as well. Thank you. Outstanding contribution by Belgium, thank you. Um, so I say to our Cypriot colleagues, and of course our Belgian colleagues, we've taken note of both. Our secretari Secretariat has taken note of both contributions and we will progress both within the uh, procedures that we have including within the review and the speakers conference so um, thank you for this and we we, we have uh, noted both uh, points um, and we will progress those so if there are no other um, contributions at this point I think I can now with Mrs. Svetanov uh, jointly we can now um, proceed to the adoption of the rules of procedure by consensus. Are they so um, adopted? I'm, I'm just amazed we've got to this point. Um, sorry. Is it okay? So they are so adopted. I don't have a hammer or anything. Okay, good. Thank you very much, colleagues. Mrs. Fatanov, do you want to? Уважаеми колеги, искам да ви благодаря за това, което направихме днес, защото това е историческо решение и съм удовлетворен от съвместната ми работа с Клод Мораес за това, че като съпредседатели на председателството ни успяхме в диалог с всички национални парламенти да можем да стигнем до този консенсус, който днес приехме. Благодаря, защото това означава, че вече започваме същинската си работа за контрола, който трябва да бъде осъществяван върху Европол. Обеден съм, че Европол приема тези процедурни правила и ще можем действително да гарантираме тази прозрачност, която всеки един европейски гражданин иска да има към европейските институции. Благодаря ви и поздравления за доброто решение днес. So we now go to... Уважаеми колеги, преминаваме към следващата точка от дневния ред. Минало и бъдещо сътрудничество с страните от Западните Балкани. Западните Балкани са регион от стратегическа важност за Европейския съюз. Те не са просто съседи на Европа, а те са в сърцето на Европейския съюз. За сигурността на целия континент от жизнено значение е да не оставяме бели петна на картата на Европа, които могат да създадат условия на вакуум и създаване на зони на влияние от други фактори на геополитическата карта. Това е политическият прочит на ситуацията в региона. Но съществено ситуацията в този регион има и много прагматични измерения в сферата на сигурността. Борбата с контрабандата на стоки и наркотици, борбата с трафика на хора, 
превенцията на радикализацията и работата по отношение на идентифицирането и неутрализирането на завръщащите се чужди бойци, които са сражавали на страната на Ислямска държава. А знаем, че по доклада на Европол 800 са гражданите от Западните Балкани, които са се сражавали за Ислямска държава. А сега трябва да се търси начин да се върнат по родината си и точно за това трябва да бъде осъществен и необходимият контрол. Управлението на миграционните потоци и контрола на границите. Това са само някои от примерите за конкретните сфери, в които държавите от Западните Балкани могат да дадат своя принос към общата сигурност на континента. В този контекст е важно да получим пълната картина за състоянието на сътрудничеството на Европол с тези държави, т.е. какво работи и какво носи резултат, къде са предизвикателствата и какво предстои и в бъдеще. В този контекст за мен е удоволствие да дам думата на заместник и изпълнителния директор на агенцията господин Олдрич Мартино, за да представи ситуацията от гледна точка на Европол, а след това ще дадем думата и на господин Владимир Ребич, генерален полицейски директор в Министерство на вътрешни работи на Сърбия, за да може също да даде своя пример за сътрудничеството с Европол. Господин Мартино, заповядайте. Добре вечер, благодаря, мистер Цветанов, дир мистер Мораес, унорабел мембрес от Европейн парламент, members of national parliaments, Madam, sirs, first of all, I would like to thank for having been invited to your session and to contribute to this important topic on, on Western Balkan. As, as it has been just uh, underlined by Mr. Cvetanov, Western Balkan region remains a key strategic area for EU, key strategic area also for Europol, in particular for security-related issues as it has been several times reflected, and in particular recently in February in EU Commission communication on Western Balkan initiative, which sets up an overall strategy for Western Balkan. And what is important, it also includes a flagship initiative, initiative on internal security and migration, when the role of JHA uh, agencies and in particular of Europol in the Western Balkan region is expected to be further enhanced. Also, Bulgarian presidency putting very strong emphasis, in particular in terms of capacity building within and with the region, based on concrete initiatives with the aim towards some tangible results in the area of security. Now, uh, let me present some brief overview on the crime situation in the Western Balkan region, which is based on our strategic uh, threat assessment and also on uh, analytical products. The region uh, remains both a transit and a destination area for several types of illicit goods. It is also the area of uh, origin for some property and violent crimes, the production of illicit drugs and goods that are smuggled to the Balkan countries and then further on trafficked to the territory of European Union. Migrant smuggling is predicted to remain also a key problem for the region. Balkan Road, despite the decreased number of transit detected, is still one of the key routes for secondary movements into EU. The number of detected cases of human trafficking, as well as the number of identified and potential victims in the Western Balkan countries, indicates that the issue of human trafficking is on the decline and there are no indications on, of an increase. Organized property crime remains an issue for the Western Balkan. The crime rate in the region remains high, and so is the number of Balkan groups which are involved in property crime on the territory of the uh, European Union. The smuggling of excise goods, mainly cigarettes, is another feature in the Western Balkan. Goods is smuggled within the border of the Balkan countries as well as further on to the territory of EU. <laughs> Criminal groups originating from Western Balkan region are heavily involved in the trafficking of firearms to the EU. These groups typically have strong links to diaspora communities based in the destination countries on the territory of EU. Production and smuggling of drugs in the Western Balkan, especially cannabis and synthetic drugs, 
represents the most dominant and the most profitable type of organized crime in which the largest number of organized crime groups are involved. Cybercrime is also on the rise. There are different types of crime are registered, such as denial of service attacks, mostly directed against the website of private companies for the purpose of extortion. As far as terrorism is concerned, the key locations in some Western Balkan countries had been a reliable source of radicalization and recruitment, but to a lesser extent of departures of the recruited foreign fighters to Syria compared to the previous period of time. By now, around 800 persons have traveled to the conflict zones in Syria and Iraq from the Western Balkan region to join Islamic State. And the Islamic movements are closely interconnected across the region and linked to the EU member states with their Western Balkan diaspora. When it comes to the cooperation between Europol and Western Balkan, we played and we continue to play a relevant role in the region by supporting operations to tackle main criminal activities such as drugs, trafficking, weapons and migrant smuggling as well as counterterrorism. This is facilitated by the fact that uh, all Western Balkan partners have concluded and ratified operational agreements with Europol and they have posted or are just about to post their license officers to the headquarters to The Hague. These officers, just being in our headquarters, can take part in operational meetings, they can coordinate activities, provide advice, and in particular, maintain the regular contact with our experts, analysts, and other license officers from member states. Uh, just to illustrate the added value of the contribution which uh, was provided by Western Balkan, uh, I have uh, two examples of uh, operations uh, uh, showing the joint uh, cooperation between EU member states and Western Balkan law enforcement partners. November 2017, joint operation, joint action day Calibre, which was led by United Kingdom with support of uh, Europol and, and Frontex. Operation designed against firearms trafficking and ma migrant smuggling. So physical checks carried out at the border crossings, mainly in the Western Balkan region, region, and it resulted in a seizure of 136 firearms, 18 individuals arrested, and 150 individuals were prevented from illegally entering territory of EU. Along uh, 14 EU member states, Switzerland, Europol, Frontex, EU and ODC, and uh, co uh, partners from Western Balkan, Albania, Bosnia Herzegovina, Montenegro, Firom, Serbia, also Kosovo participated. Second example, Operation Penta Benji, February this year, involving partners from Servi Serbia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Slovenia, and Croatia as, as member states, and it was focused on organized crime activities of facilitation of migrant smuggling from territory of Western Balkan to Western Europe. Also, EULEX, Kosovo, and uh, Europol Migrant Smuggling Center participated, which uh, led to the arrest of 16 individuals. What is also positive when we see increasing number of operational meetings organized at Europol when partners from law enforcement uh, agencies Western Balkan participated. Moreover, cooperation with Western Balkan is also high on the agenda of the current EU policy cycle and its implementation for 2018. All the countries of the region have been identified as partners to cooperate with for at least 19 operational actions in area of cannabis, cocaine, heroin, firearms, illegal migration and organized property crime. What is also positive, all Western Balkan countries contributed to serious organized crime threat assessment are strategic flagship. I would also like to highlight some regional activities in the field of police cooperation which have been sponsored by EU member states and uh, uh, which Europol is supporting in line with the priorities of EU policy cycle. Firstly, integrative internal security governance concept, which is coordination platform for Western Balkan launched in Bordeaux. Uh, aim is to promote internal security governance, capacity building and reform at regional level. It can be seen as some kind of Western Balkan EU policy 
policy cycle, which can be harmonized with the activities we carry out at, at EU level. Secondly, joint operational office in Vienna, official launch in 2016 under umbrella impact facilitated illegal migration. It is focusing on Western Balkan in terms of a response to any urgent emergency cases in the region which might occur. And third example, Western Balkans instrument of pre-accession IPA 2017, uh, which is driven or coordinated by Italy and focusing on activities in the region in the field of cross-border cooperation among law enforcement of uh, EU member states and, and third partners. Despite the, I would say, promising picture I just described, there is nevertheless a need for further strengthening of cooperation. So that's why we permanently encourage all involved countries, both EU members and the Western Balkan partners, to share with us as much information as they can, in particular in the more critical areas, such as drug production and trafficking, firearms, illegal migration and property crime, as well as on foreign terrorist fighters which originate from territory of Western Balkan. So all necessary instruments are at disposal. We have uh, operational agreements. Uh, partners are technically connected in a secure manner via Siena. They have license officers. So we only have to ensure that we will make use of these tools to the maximum ex extent. Last but not least, I would like to ab update you about another pilot project on deployment of Europol license officers to Western Balkan. In the first pilot stage, we are going to deploy our license officers to Serbia, Montenegro and Albania with expected deployment in summer. And uh, we expect that it should lead to increase and more proactive operational cooperation, especially with law enforcement. Just to conclude, a lot of has been done. There is positive uh, development. We have still some security concerns, but those countries actively participated in finding solutions together with us. And there is a lot of work to be done. So Europol remains at disposal of EU member states and Western Balkan partners just to assist you and support your joint operation, just to improve security and safety on both territories, EU and also Western Balkan. Thank you. Благодаря господин Мартино. Аз смятам, че това, което беше казано като един цялостен обзор и оценка, има много добри неща, които са направени, но разбира се остава отворена възможността за надграждане на този капацитет и възможността да се участва активно в регионални инициативи и Западните Балкани да бъдат подкрепяни и поощрявани. Точно в тази връзка се възползвам от правото си да дам думата на Владимир Ребич, генерален полицейски директор в Министерство на вътрешните работи на Република Сърбия, за да ни предостави опита и начина по който те работят в момента с Европол и разбира се както преглед, но така също и добрите практики, които вече реализират. Благодаря. Ladies and gentlemen, it is great honor to address you on behalf of the Minister of Interior of the Republic of Serbia and my personal behalf. It is very important meeting to both the Minister of Interior for the security issues to be discussed here in the, <coughs> and the Republic of Serbia itself, given the Euro European prospect of the Western Balkans. Today's security situation in Europe is very complex, and among other things, it is consequence of numerous threats and challenges the most frequent of which are illegal migration besides terrorism and organized crime. These security threats and challenges went beyond state border long time ago. They jeopardize all values of the modern democratic society and represent a serious threat to the security of all citizens. That's, that is why our response has to be tough at both national and regional and European level through mutual assistance and cooperation above all. The Republic of Serbia is actively involved in the <coughs> in cooperations and joint activities with other countries, especially the Western Balkan countries, which is a region a great significant to Europol, with a view to building up regional and security sec and European security. 
the Republic of Serbia has been efficiently implementing the operational agreement with Europol since 2014. Since June 2014, when Serbia became a Europol operational partner, until today, over the 21,500 messages has, have been exchanged with Europol and police agency at EU and non-EU countries through Siena. Each of these messages exchanged contains considerable amount of operational information important for further cross-analysis against database in Europol and EU countries. Given that the number of messages exchanged through Siena is constantly and greatly growing according to Europol statistics, especially in the areas of terrorism and fight against the illegal migration, drug and arms trafficking, and that all countries in Europe and beyond have been increasingly switching to cooperation through Europol channel, it is necessary to proceed with efficient cooperation with Europol and to strengthen capacity for the successful cooperation. In addition, as the third party part, we have encouraged the importance of the involvement in the implementation of the EU policy cycle 2014-2017. Therefore, over the last three years, we have actively participated under the auspices of Europol, together with countries of the region and EU <coughs> members, countries, in more than 70 jo 17 joint international police operations against all type of crim crimes, especially the combat against the smuggling of migrations, arms, smuggling of cybercrime impact. Serbia shall continue to follow the priority of the EU policy cycle 2018-2021 set by the EU SOCTA 2017 and shall bring itself in accord with the operational plans for formulated by, sorry, uh, by EU member states by actively participating under the umbrella of Europol in joint police operational and may dismantling organized crime group. The national SOCTA document was drawn and adopted for the first time at the late 2015 within the Serbian interior interminister with the application of Europol methodology for devising a strategic documents. This was a major task for the minister and at the same time the fulfillment of one of the obligations for joining the European Union, which are defined in the recommendation of the European Commission in the Action Plan for Chapter 24. Subsequently, in 2016, the regional series of organized crime threat assessment was made in joint response of Serbia, Montenegro, and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in the fight against most serious type of crimes, which sent a clear message to, that we wish to have a safe region and security for all citizens. This is the beginning of a new approach which are leading as toward more efficient actions in the field in accordance with the international standards and best practice in developed countries Europe. In addition, cooperation between police services with Europol is of extreme importance and has been increasingly intensive. One of the best examples that I would like to emphasize in cooperation with Europol analytic pro projects. Serbia is full member with 13 Europol analytics projects, in all four in the field of drug, drugs, two in the field of terrorism, and also in the field of human trafficking, smuggling of migra migrants, child pornography, cybercrime, counter counterfeiting of money, illegal production, uh, and smuggling of cigarettes, and arms smuggling. Let me emphasize significant support Europol offers to regional initiative in the Western Balkan with the view of developing, developing operational support with the Western Balkan countries. The efforts invested in strengthening cooperation in Western Balkan countries, especially in the field of the countering terrorism, count, continue. Serbia will continue to provide regular the information, importance of Europol and all its partners, while that needs to be strengthened. And the very request from the Serbian police in Europol 
in order to get insight into the need for possible launch of parallel and other joint investigations. The proactive role of Europol so far is the implementation of the activity of the Western Balkan Counterterrorism Initiative, with which a lot of significant information has been exchanged and important ex experience shared since foundation at 2011 to date should also be viewed in, the, in that context. The Republic of Serbia is only Western Balkan country which has shared its national FTF foreign, fight, fighters, uh, foreign terrorist fighters list via the special Siena channel to all these country counter-terrorism partners against without a, an exception. The Republic of Serbia has also provided national FTF list for ins insertion into the Europol information system and also ag agrees that this list should be provided for Schengen system, thus contributing with its national data to, to the security of the European Union in fight against terrorism. Over the past three years, we have invest, uh, witnessed that mass movement of refugees from the countries devastated by war, as well as, as economic immigrations along the Western Balkan route. This posed a potential threat and could have been taken advantage of by terrorism who wish to, to reach countries they find interesting for the execution of attacks. Luckily, thanks to good corporations of the Western Balkan country, this huge flow of immigrants has been stopped. However, despite the fact that there is control over immigrants entering the territory of Republic of Serbia, we still have to be additional cautious, cautious and with the support of Europol, improve the very successful cooperation to date and exchanging the information among Western Balkan countries. I believe that we will agree that the organized crime, terrorism, immigration, and issues accompanying immigration, such as smuggling of, smuggling of people, present a global problem, but I think that with the support of Europol, strong, stronger cooperation above all and timely exchange, exchanging of intelligence of the, in the region are crucial for responding to all the challenges we are faced with, particularly for the implementing of coordinating activity with the view of suppressing potential threats. The Minister of Interior of the Republic of Serbia is, as before, ready to fully contribute to, the, to, to that aim. Let me express my gratitude for exceptional support Europol has given to the Serbia police and underline the strong commitment of the Ministry of Interior of the Republic of Serbia to engage in all regional and European security process, processes, as well as give to its full contribution with its possibility to stability and security through intensive cooperation with all partners. Thank you. Благодаря аз, господин Ревич. Смятам, че това, което казахте и това, което акцентирахте за увеличаване на информационния обмен с Европол и тук това, което казахте, над 21 хиляди съобщения за Сиена, това означава много и тук действително трябва всеки един от нас да даде заслуженото за досегашния директор на Европол Роб Лайнрайт, който заедно с негови екип отвориха възможността и създадоха необходимата среда за обмяна на информация. И аз мога да го говоря и като част от новоприятите членки в Европейския съюз България. И знам каква беше препоръката на Роб Лайнрайт във всяка една среща, която сме провеждали. Винаги е настоявал информационния обмен да се увеличава, защото споделената информация с файловете, които са в Европол, дава възможност за по-добрите анализи и по-добрите препоръки, за да бъде много по-ефективни. Аз искам да благодаря на господин Ребич, който успя така да сподели добрите практики, добрите операции. И тук, разбира се, вече даваме възможност за отваряне на дебат и за всеки, който би искал да вземе думата. Понеже спазваме регламента, който беше обявен в началото, вече има заявено изказване от господин Кетирус, от Кипър. Давам думата 
за да може действително да се движим по денния ред. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Martino, and Mr. Rebitz. We are aware how spreading Islamization in the Western Balkans has also resulted in providing fighters for the Islamic State or other Islamic extremist organizations. Do you reckon that such a structured and targeted approach is funded and directed by state structures or only by terrorist organizations and religious cycles? Thank you. Благодаря и аз. Заявено е изказване от госпожа Карамали, Национална асамблея на Франция. Заповядайте. Благодаря. Et de la coopération. Je voulais juste euh, insister particulièrement sur le trafic d'armes. Je suis, on fait partie un petit peu euh, en France de ceux qui regrettent que la directive européenne sur les armes n'a pas intégré cette question. Mais nous espérons que justement peut-être dans les, dans les mois à venir, et compte tenu la, la gravité de cette question, puisse avoir, on puisse avoir des initiatives dans ce domaine. L'Assemblée nationale, à plusieurs reprises, a pris position sur ce sujet, a insisté justement sur la traçabilité, sur la question de l'importance de la traçabilité des armes, d'améliorer la fiabilité des fichiers nationaux, de le marquage. Et aujourd'hui, tout le monde rappelle qu'il y a vraiment un vrai problème de contrôle des armes neutralisées ou démantelées, finalement, et qui servent à aujourd'hui à être réutilisé et réadapté pour, pour la même, on l'a vu lors des différents attentats qu'on a pu connaître, il y a eu quand même quelque part par trafic d'armes justement un reconditionnement des, des armes et donc ils ont été utilisés. Alors ma question, notre question est simple est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire qu -ce que, euh, quelles sont les initiatives que Europol peut prendre pour ré, réactiver réactiver, je dirais, le débat sur le trafic d'armes et que l'Europe puisse finalement s'en saisir lors de, des prochaines discussions qui pourront s'ouvrir après les élections. Merci. Thank you for your question. Actually, If I recall correctly, a year ago, I was invited to European Parliament, I think to Libé. There was some dedicated discussion when the directive on weapons was just put forward. So we provided some justification and proposals. But of course, we remain ready to share the information about the trends, about what's going on in the area of fire, uh, firearms trafficking to be at your disposal when you put forward the, the, the actually legislative legislative proposals and of course as a police officers uh, we just support any kind of registration marking making uh, weapons uh, traceable and also we face problem with changing of blind firing weapons which are converted to the fully functional weapons, yes. Yeah? So actually, it should, this topic should be covered as well. So we remain at your disposal and we can share everything what we have just to support your activities in legislative process. Благодаря, господин Мартино. Има заявено изказване от нашите гости от Западните Балкани. Това е на господин Клевис Балю гост от Западните Балкани, от парламента на Албания. Нека да вземе думата. Благодаря ви много. Аз първо да ви благодаря за Европейската Европа и Европол за всичко, което е предложено за моята страна, от вас, в защото на организацията на организацията. В последните few years ми е възможно Uh, major problems with security when it comes to drug trafficking and we highly appreciate all the involvement of uh, Europol uh, in this war. As you know better than I, uh, drug money are one of the major sources for 
terrorist organizations. Therefore, I believe that it is of uh, crucial importance to have uh, uh, to have a more frontal uh, approach towards uh, uh, drug traffickers in Western Balkan. Thank you. Благодаря и аз. Уважаеми колеги, няма поступили други заявки за изказвания. Искам все пак да приканя всички национални делегации дали някой би искал да вземе думата. Иска да вземе думата Роб Лайнрайт. Заповядайте, господин директор. Благодаря, господин Фетанов. Просто една кратка ремарка от моя страна, да комплементите думата на моя Uh, Deputy Executive Director, uh, good morning everyone, by the way. Um, uh, Mr. Svetanov also referred to why Europol puts a lot of emphasis on the need for uh, always improving information exchange. He's right, it is the basis of all of the work that we do. And now turning to the region of the Western Balkans, uh, there has been significant improvements in the uh, cooperation between Europol and each of the constituent law enforcement authorities in this region. But I have to say the picture is still a mixed picture, that we uh, have very good information exchange with some countries, but not good with others. Uh, so a general message from Europol is that you know, our work is still not done in terms of fully integrating our friends and colleagues in that region to the community of law enforcement cooperation in Europe. Uh, and so, from a point of view of uh, parliamentary scrutiny, I think it's good that, that uh, we understand that we have to continue with our efforts on a constant basis to encourage the best possible cooperation, uh, because it is critical for, for our work. And at the moment, there are still gaps in, in the way that uh, we, are, we are sharing this information. Thank you. Благодаря, господин Лайнрайт. Има поступило искане за изказване от госпожа Бояна Потокан от Словения. Заповядайте. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. National Council from Slovenia. According to the Global Peace Index of 2017, Slovenia ranks at number seven and therefore finds uh, itself among the safest countries of the world. But because of the geographical position, history, language, cultural and economic relations, we too are affected by the criminal uh, events happening along the so-called Balkan route, where Slovenia mainly acts as a transit country and enters into EU. The area of Western Balkans represents the focal point for logistical planning of drug and weapon, uh, weapon trafficking, illegal migrations, and the consequence gives to opportunity uh, to form new markets for or organized criminal groups. We are aware of the fact that no one has the ability to solve the problems alone, and therefore, we firmly believe that a further close cooperation among member states, Europol, Interpol, uh, countries of the Western Balkans and the counter-terrorist group, and efforts made uh, as part of Western Balkan counter-terrorism initiative are the key of countering crime in the area in the long run. And of course, many compliments for nice organization. Thank you. Благодаря и аз. Няма поступили нови заявки за изказвания, с което можем действително да поздравим колегите от Европол за това, което са направили и начина по който искат да надграждат този капацитет заедно с Западните Балкани. Искам да поощрим и Западните Балкани и тук също така да дадем възможност за едно голямо благодаря на вижте професионална фигура на Сърбия, която имаше възможност действително днес да говори по добрите практики и това, което е постигнато. Но съм убеден, че с наложеният стандарт на Роб Лайнрайт, който знаем, че 
май месец изтича неговият втори мандат като директор на Европол. Нека също така да поощрим и да дадем кредит на доверие на белгийската страна, защото знаем, че Катрин Дебол е шеф на полицията на Белгия, която стана новият директор на Европол и съм убеден, че всичко това, което взимаме днес като решение и това, което ще трябва да продължим за напред, ще можем да го правим заедно и от националните парламенти ще се получава необходимата подкрепа заедно с Европейския парламент. Тук е момента да дам думата на моят колега и приятел, съпредседателят господин Клод Морайс, който да започне по следващата тема от дневния ред, а това е обмяната на мнение, проекта на многогодишното програмиране на Европол 2019-2021. Заповядайте, господин. Thank you very much, Svetan. And as you can see, colleagues, we are going through the agenda. Извинявам се много, но постъпи последно искане от испанската делегация, които държат да направят изказване. Съжалявам, не беше подадено към момента, в който обявих прекратяване на изказанията. Заповядайте, колегите от Испания. Моля ви само микрофона, включете. Sí. Muchas gracias eh, a todos los representantes en, esta importante, en este importante grupo de control de Europol. Y lo primero que quiero hacer es que declarar en nombre de la delegación española que el modelo de Europol es un modelo de éxito, es un modelo que está funcionando muy bien y que me parece muy adecuado el, el que establezcamos... Eh, colaboración con países no pertenecientes a la Unión Europea y más en concreto con los Balcanes, donde hay una, una eh, ruta de, de organizaciones criminales organizadas y que además es una de las rutas de entrada de terroristas en, en Europa. Eh, creemos que esta colaboración debe ser eh, intensa, debe ser una colaboración que esté marcada en el intercambio de informaciones que puedan evitar este tipo de delitos que crean muchísima alarma en nuestros países, como son el tráfico de armas, el tráfico de seres humanos para explotación sexual, el tráfico de inmigrantes ilegales, la entrada de droga en nuestros países que afectan a nuestra juventud y, por tanto, creemos que hay que intensificar esta labor. Creemos también que las policías de nuestros estados están colaborando muy bien y que Europa es un espacio de, de seguridad. Pero tenemos el reto que nos preocupa a todos muchos del terrorismo y el terrorismo hay que prevenirlo y para poder evitarlo. Y es una petición que nos hacen nuestros ciudadanos y tenemos que colaborar desde la máxima lealtad entre los países que formamos la Unión Europea y los que colaboran con nosotros. Muchas gracias. Вече давам думата на господин Морайс. Thank you very much, Svetan, and thank you, colleagues, for the discussion on the Western Balkans. It's a crucial issue for Europol. Um, now we uh, move to um, the question of the uh, Europol multi-annual work program. Again, I'm delighted that we can now move to um, the actual work of, of Europol, having um, finalised the the rules, and I'm delighted that we can go to the, to the substance. And for this, we have um, a presentation by Rob Wainwright. Um, Mr. Svetanov, of course, thanked Rob on behalf of the national parliaments. Um, you can thank people too much, I reckon, but I do need to um, put on record the, the thanks of the European Parliament. Uh, Rob has been the head of Europol for nine years. He took office in 2009. His mandate will end in April 2018. And I think all of us would agree uh, that he has um, provided outstanding leadership to this agency. Um, 
creating something that which we can all be proud. Um, and I would also like to warmly welcome, on behalf of the European Parliament and the Libé Committee, um, Catherine de Bol from Belgium. Um, I know she will be an outstanding director of Europol. She has already appeared before our committee, and a warm welcome to Catherine. Um, and now we go, as I said, to the substance of what the of what Europol does, and um, we very much look forward to the presentation by the executive director of Europol, Mr. Rob Wainwright. Rob. Thank you very much, uh, Claude, also for those kind remarks, um, and the same, of course, towards uh, Svetan. So um, it's a pleasure for me now to uh, introduce Europol's multi-annual program, programming document uh, for the period 2019 to 21, and it's comprised of three main elements. The strategic objectives based on our five-year program, uh, what our resource programming is, and our external strategy also. Okay. Well, one second, excuse me. Oh, you have a better touch than me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so firstly, Europol's strategy is, is framed over, uh, currently at least, over the five-year period culminating in, in 2020. And we aim uh, to be flexible within that because, in the end, Europol's role is to provide dynamic, flexible operational support to the member states. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we do work, of course, to main strategic goals around uh, fundamental concepts of increasing information uh, exchange and providing operational support, especially in those priority areas of serious organized crime, cybercrime, and terrorism. Is it this one? To achieve this, Europol um, are continuously developing, especially its core IT solutions. And you can see here some evidence of how this is leading to significant increases in the use of our core systems, such as Siena and the Europol information system. In fact, last year, uh, for the first time, we passed more than one million exchanges, intelligence reports that were exchanged on Siena. And at the same time, the Europol information system also contained more than one million uh, data entries. So this is now quite a big industrialized operation of, of information sharing across a community of over 1,000 law enforcement agencies that are now cooperating on the Europol uh, channel. Uh, the Europol platform for experts as well uh, as hosting now 50 platforms uh, in which 13,000 users are sharing their police expertise and knowledge uh, amongst each other. We have a 24-7 uh, operational center to ensure that we can provide the quickest possible support. And you can see also um, that we are very active in the field with our so-called mobile office uh, deployments as well. Looking ahead uh, to 2019 and beyond, uh, Europol will further, this clicker is, excuse me. Um, Europol will further invest in technology and business innovation, um, especially to try and increase our, the means by which we can deal with this significant expansion in our information sharing. Uh, to do that, uh, to give you uh, some, uh, some perspective, over nine years, the amount of information sharing that Europol is now dealing with every day is nine times the amount it was nine years ago. So a nine-fold increase. This is an enormous increase. And yet the, the budgetary increase, the resource increase for Europol over that period is two times. So to cope with nine times uh, growth in our core work with just uh, a two times resource uh, capability means we have to continuously invest in innovation and technology with very smart, modern data science solutions uh, especially. This is fundamental. Uh, to the work of Europol and to securing uh, our future um, success. Of course, whilst at the same time uh, developing our operational cooperation as well. <coughs> now, as for our core work, of course, we provide this operational information exchange in the end to identify opportunities 
to support the Member States' authorities to take practical police-led operations on the ground uh, to actually prevent crime or, or disrupt criminal organizations. That's the whole point of our information sharing. And you can see the operational outputs uh, currently that are um, pursued through Europol. So in l last year, we supported around 1,500 high-level operations, producing more than 19,000 operational reports, uh, 113 action days. These are very large-scale um, multidimensional operations across a very large number of countries are focused on the key elements of organized crime and terrorism, for example. So again, these are significant increases on, on, on the previous years as well. We have high satisfaction, we have high satisfaction rates currently from the surveys um, that we are running with our operational partners. Um, and also getting good feedback for our ability to deploy uh, what we call Euro Europol mobile support and mobile analysis teams, um, especially to the uh, locations on the external border of the European Union. At the European Cybercrime Centre, perhaps we have the most innovative development of our capability, where we are developing very cutting-edge solutions on decryption and on providing uh, digital forensic analysis support uh, to uh, uh, our member states as well. Also, uh, in regard to uh, removing terrorist content online, last year the European Internet Referral Unit Europol assessed almost 26,000 contents and is now working with over 80 social media platforms for referring uh, this, this, this work. Looking ahead um, to, in the area of uh, serious and organized crime, uh, the priorities of the EU policy cycle are, of course, very important for us, and we work within this, this framework, and it, this provides the, the main area for the focus of our operational work. We will focus, continue to focus on the tasks in, in the so-called operational action plans, and also developing um, new priority areas in a more substantial way, for example, on criminal finances, money laundering, and environmental crime. In addition, we're trying to inject more energy and life into the uh, drug strategy of cooperation across Europe. This remains, um, in volume terms, still the biggest crime sector in Europe, still affecting many thousands of our citizens every day, as you know, and is, uh, has been uh, a very difficult part of fighting crime for, for decades. We must not uh, become complacent and we must continue to look for new ways to deal with this. We're working towards the Malta implementation plan um, on migration, especially in combating people smuggling groups. Uh, and also, of course, providing at the same time flexible operational support um, to other areas. So we, we follow our main priorities, but where there are very high-profile high requests to support investigations, then of course we will respond urgently. This we have done in recent months uh, in Malta and now in Slovakia uh, to respond to the request to support uh, very important investigations into uh, the tragic cases in each of those countries uh, regarding the murder of uh, journalists. In the area of cybercrime, our cybercrime center is expanding its focus also on monitoring criminality on the dark web, um, but also um, many other areas, such as the way in which cryptocurrencies at the moment, for example, are exploited by criminals. On terrorism, trying to achieve greater information exchange, uh, and this we have also succeeded in, in, in many ways whilst continuing to improve our monitoring of, of terrorist content online. Looking ahead, the new access we will have to travel data, I think it will be a, a very rich new source of, of information for Europol. And we've started working with member states on the future development of their passenger information units, for example. We remain committed, of course, as you might expect, to being an accountable and efficient organization. We recognize that with 
the increased work of Europol, uh, the increased impact it has on the internal security of our citizens, uh, and the increased profile that what comes with that is uh, extra responsibility for the organization to remain transparent and accountable in, in its work. Um, I'm pleased to say that we've had uh, uh, good audit reports in, in recent years regarding the implementation of our budgets and the implementation of our work programme. Of course, over the last uh, one year, uh, the very important work involved in implementing the new Europol regulation as well, uh, establishing new cooperation mechanisms, for example, with the European Data Protection Supervisor, which is our new supervisory authority, and I'm very pleased that uh, uh, we have the deputy director here today um, and the, dep the deputy supervisor here today. I have established a very good working relationship with Mr. Buttarelli uh, and, and his, his senior staff, and I'm very happy at the way in which Europol and EDPS have so far established their, their cooperation in this important area. Of course, parliamentary scrutiny uh, uh, also is highly important for us. Uh, through uh, the recognition and the support and the advice of national and European parliaments, uh, Europol can uh, project its image in, in, in a better, more transparent way. So I believe our, our, our ways of being accountable to parliaments is, is an absolutely essential part of, uh, of the work of Europol. And for that reason, I'm, I'm delighted that today uh, this committee has established the rules of procedure um, for the JPSG, uh, and I congratulate um, Mr. Moraes, Mrs. Vedanov, Mr. Diaz de Mera, uh, and all of you for, for achieving this important milestone. Uh, meanwhile, Europol's governance and support and administration functions have, of course, um, uh, increased uh, in order to support the operational work that we have had. It's put an awful lot of um, stress on our budget. Um, in this area, of course, you'd expect me always to, uh, uh, to, as an agency director, to make the case for uh, in increasing the budget. But as I said earlier, when we increase so much uh, in, our, in our core work and have uh, only a relatively modest in increase in our budget, then of course it, it, it produces uh, new demands on the organization. Uh, Europol takes this responsibility to continue to be ever more efficient, of course, so we don't automatically uh, expect uh, a budget increases just because our work um, is becoming more, more challenging. But there are some areas where we're feeling real stress to respond to the new priorities that have been given to Europol. And one of those uh, is certainly in the area of our IT um, uh, information technology capability. I mention this because I think it's the, perhaps the, the greatest risk that Europol has uh, to its effectiveness in the, in the next few years. Um, although we have had um, important increases to our budgets and resources in recent years, supported by uh, not least the Libby Committee in the European Parliament and, and Council, these have always been increases that have gone directly to our operational areas, such as on terrorism. Of course, this is understandable. But every time we do this, uh, we have failed at the same time to adjust the capabilities, for example, of our IT department. So this uh, means that there is an unbalanced injection of resources uh, into Europol. And this, is, this would be difficult to adjust uh, for any agency but at Europol, uh, I think we all have to recognize that the IT support of Europol is not like any other agency. It's not providing just computers and a network for exchanging data. It's not a support department. It is a frontline area of Europol's work. We are nothing apart from our ability to collect and exchange and analyze data. So the, the colleagues we have working in our ID department are some of the for example, best data scientists that you see in Europe. But so their ability, therefore, to, to provide that operational support is affected when we cannot adjust the IT resources of this area. So my appeal to uh, all of our colleagues in the different parliaments is to recognize, please, that in the future uh, we need 
to refresh the way in which Europol can maintain its core business of sharing information. And finally, of course, in ter terms of our external strategy uh, between 2017 and 20, uh, you see the list of our priority countries here. Of course, it includes the United States of America, uh, where we have over 12 uh, federal agencies now integrated into the liaison officer community of Europol. It includes, as we've just been discussing, of course, the area of the Western Balkans, but also the MENA countries, and I recently enjoyed a very successful, interesting visit to Algeria to try and develop our cooperation there. The Chairman of the Europol Management Board, Mr. Parkna, will uh, follow me shortly uh, to tell you uh, more about the external strategy in more detail. My very last point um, is to echo the words of Claude Moraes uh, in uh, welcoming the appointment of my successor, uh, Mrs. Catherine de Bolle. Uh, she will make an excellent uh, executive director of, of Europol. I'm very pleased that with the choice that, um, that, that the institutions have taken. Uh, and already she had an excellent introductory session, I think, um, uh, at the Libby Committee. So uh, the organization is certainly safe for the future, uh, uh, whilst I've been very happy and privileged to lead it in the, in, in the last nine years. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for that presentation. Very interesting. Now, I've been told that the colleagues who wish to speak, your names will magically appear on the screen on the left. I mean, I'm happy with pen and paper and all of this, but see what I mean? They've not magically appeared. So now we have paper. It's called the backup, anyway. So let's see if I can read everyone's handwriting. So... Um, so we start with Marietta Caramanelli from France, please. So colleagues, there's quite a few speakers, so quite brief and concise, and try a question as well. Okay, thank you. Merci. Je voulais aussi féliciter tout le travail important qui a été fourni et cette activité très dense et l'investissement de d'Europol sur les différents champs à travers l'Europe et au-delà. Et, et donc, euh, voilà, on, je, je, on disait tout à l'heure avec ma collègue à, à côté, on, on aurait pu vraiment vous applaudir, et je pense qu'on peut vous applaudir, vraiment. Et euh, parallèlement, euh, vous avez insisté sur, à la fois sur votre capacité de faire face aux besoins euh, qui augmentent, des investissements nécessaires demandé à travers les prochains budgets, si j'ai bien compris. Est-ce que ces demandes sont formulées au niveau de l'ensemble de des États membres de l'Union européenne Premier élément. Deuxième élément, vous avez insisté particulièrement sur le travail que vous, vous faites au niveau des échanges et, et, et analyser les données. Échanger et analyser les données, c'est votre fond de travail et de coopération au niveau européen. Alors, deux, deux questions très précises euh, concernant les, euh, ces données. Je crois qu'il y a eu aussi une demande de, de, de la Commission européenne pour que vous puissiez mener des négociations avec un certain nombre de pays euh, au-delà de, au de, de, de l'Union européenne, la Turquie, Tunisie, pour, de, pour certaines thématiques. Si vous pouvez nous donner un peu plus d'éléments sur, sur cette commande qui vous a été passée, d'une certaine manière, mission. Et puis, nous parler un petit peu aussi de ce que vous faites sur les besoins et les, en matière d'intervention sur les hotspots, euh, en matière de poursuite, en deuxième ligne, en seconde ligne, si j'ai bien compris, dans votre mission. Merci. Thank you very much. So the names have, in fact, appeared. Um, could I just mention, this is a very long session up to lunch, so I understand there is some coffee outside. Uh, don't abandon the hall or anything, but there is coffee outside if somebody wants to get you some coffee, because it's quite unusually long and we didn't have a, a break. I'm not talking about myself, I'm just saying if you want to have coffee. Okay, so next is Mr. Metsu from Belgium, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Wainwright, uh, and please let me start by congratulating you as well for the past decade. You did an amazing job uh, over the past eight, nine years. 
big shoes to fill, uh, but we are quite convinced that Ms. De Bolle will continue your, your great job. Now, almost uh, two years ago, Belgium was under attack. Uh, we suffered uh, a terrorist attack on March 22nd. 2016 and 35 people died. More than 340 persons uh, from different nationalities were injured very badly. Uh, and we've noticed uh, that the info sharing is crucial, info sharing in between key players. Now, last week, uh, we visited Europol with our delegation. We were hosted very well. It was very interesting. Um, Mr. Martino was, uh, was there as well. Uh, and he mentioned as well that one year ago, 85% uh, of the information in Europol's database uh, came from five member countries. So 15% was related to 23 uh, member countries. Uh, and I think that this is still our Achilles heel and we need to overcome and tackle this, uh, this problem. Um, I've heard uh, you say, Mr. Wainwright, that you also uh, state that our job is still not done. We need to convince one another to share all that relevant uh, intel and information. Uh, because uh, knowledge is power to overcome terrorist attacks and other, uh, other crimes. So it'll take us too far, I reckon, to discuss this right now, but please note this as uh, one of our uh, major concerns in the, in, the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Metsu. Now, Mr. Diaz de Mera from the European Parliament. Muchas gracias. Señores copresidentes, eh, quiero pedirles licencia para extenderme un poco más y tanto más cuanto que no hablé en el anterior proceso de las reglas de procedimiento. Bueno, mis palabras son un sencillo pero sentido homenaje a Rob. A, director de Europol. Y quiero explicar por qué. Eh, fui ponente de la decisión del Consejo, que daba cobertura a la actuación jurídica de Europol, y luego eh, fui ponente del reglamento de Europol. Aquí, en este proceso legislativo, Rob ha sido un factor determinante. En estos nuevos años de fructífero trabajo ha conseguido algo que era una ilusión antes, que era generar la confianza, la confianza necesaria de los Estados miembros en un trabajo muy profesional y muy bien hecho en tres direcciones, en la dirección de la neutralización de la delincuencia organizada, en la dirección del de combate al cibercrimen y en la dirección de la lucha contra el terrorismo, fundamentalmente. Eh, el ECTC, eh, la gestión del TFDP, TFTP, la lucha contra los flujos ilícitos, en las transacciones interbancarias internacionales. El IRU, con 16.000 mensajes eliminados, por cierto, a cargo de un guardia civil español. El IRU, eh, que lo metimos con forceps en la tarea legislativa que daba pábulo a la aprobación del reglamento. El EC3 los convenios estratégicos y de cooperación operativa, la lucha contra la falsificación del euro, que no se ha mencionado aquí, en fin, un largo etcétera, un largo etcétera vinculado a la labor tan profesional de Rob, del director británico de Europol. El reglamento eh, tiene dos pilares fundamentales, el pilar que acabamos de aprobar aquí esta mañana, que es el pilar del control parlamentario, 
agradezco mucho a los parlamentos nacionales su generosa contribución y también al liderazgo de la presidencia del Consejo, al liderazgo de Bulgaria y de mi amigo el presidente de la Comisión de Libertades Públicas, eh, Justicia y Asuntos de Interior, Claude Moraes. Pues bien, vamos a dar desarrollo al artículo 88 del Tratado de Funcionamiento de la Unión Europea a través de dotarnos de una norma para el control parlamentario de Europol. El control es necesario, muy necesario, porque da legitimidad y da vitalidad a la tarea de Europol. Y el otro pilar eh, que ha mencionado Rob es la protección de datos. La protección de, de datos es nada más y nada menos que la garantía de la buena tarea policial. El robusto sistema de protección de datos que tiene Europol está garantizado por la Agencia de Protección de Datos y por el señor Butarelli. Entonces, ahora, ¿qué nos queda? Nos queda decirle adiós con gratitud y con reconocimiento y cerrar unos cuantos convenios operativos y estratégicos que están pendientes y que van a llegar dentro de unos días a sede legislativa. Se han puesto ahí en, en la pantalla. Yo estoy hablando de Turquía, de Marruecos, de Argelia, de Israel, de Japón, del Líbano y de Jordania. Mis últimas palabras, señores presidentes, son las siguientes. No es admisible que para tanta tarea haya tan poco presupuesto. No es admisible que Europol funcione con 122 millones de euros. No es admisible que una agencia mmm, también muy importante, como es Frontex, tenga más del doble de presupuesto que Europol. Nos parece bien que Frontex tenga un buen presupuesto, pero nos parece muy bien que Europol tenga el presupuesto que necesita. ¿Para qué? Pues ya lo ha dicho él, lo ha dicho Rob, necesita más tecnología, mucha más tecnología y necesita muchos más medios para poder eh, llevar a buen puerto las tareas que tiene encomendadas a través del reglamento. Así es que Rob, mucha suerte, te vamos a echar mucho de menos y ya cuando llegue el momento propicio diré eh, mis palabras de bienvenida a Catrín que seguro que te va a sustituir con mucha eficacia. Nada más y muchas gracias. Thank you Augustine and and to take up the concrete point that um, Mr. Diaz de Mera made Rob um, what could you do with more you know the issue of uh, capacity and more budget and more size. Um, Mr. Mariantus from uh, Cyprus, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We want to thank also Bulgarian presidency for the hospitality. Mr. Wainwright, thank you for your contribution in Europol, and we wish you every success to your future undertaking. I have two questions to ask. We share the widely held view that corruption is a major enabler of a host of other criminal activities, as indicated also in the latest street assessment. In spite of this, we notice it does not feature much in the documents at hand. How does Europol intend to deal with this issue in the forthcoming years and in Is information exchange and analysis on corruption among the priorities of Europe, of Europol? Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Ms. Caterina Cinici from the European Parliament. Grazie, grazie Presidente Moraes e grazie alla Presidenza Bulgara che ospita la nostra riunione. Desidero anch'io ringraziare il Direttore, il, il Signor Wainwright.
per l'indirizzo che ha dato in questi anni all'attività di Europol, sostenendo la cooperazione e lo scambio di informazioni che io credo siano davvero indispensabili nell'azione di contatto ai più gravi reati di natura transfrontaliera, dal traffico di armi al traffico di sostanze stupefacenti, alla tratta di esseri umani al terrorismo. E, e concordo pienamente con quanto ha detto il collega Dias de Meira che mi ha preceduto sulla necessità di sostenere con adeguato supporto l'attività di Europol. Nell'ambito del documento di programmazione che lei oggi ci ha eh, diciamo ancora una volta presentato, uno degli aspetti che credo sia sempre più importante riguarda proprio la strategia per le relazioni con le organizzazioni internazionali, ma in particolare con i Paesi terzi. E allora a questo proposito però io credo eh, che sia fondamentale anche porre l'attenzione sulla necessità di ehm, avere diciamo, una verifica della qualità delle informazioni da una parte e sulla necessità di eh, rafforzare la sicurezza delle informazioni e della protezione dei dati, dei, dei dati personali dei cittadini europei. È, come dicevo, secondo, a mio avviso fondamentale incrementare le relazioni con i Paesi terzi per contrastare i più gravi reati di natura transfrontaliera, però sicuramente c'è da porre l'attenzione su alcuni aspetti sui quali eh, ecco, vorrei, se possibile, avere anche il suo pensiero. Grazie. Grazie, Caterina. E ora Mr. Axel Voss, anche dal Parlamento europeo. Axel. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender, und vielen Dank auch an Rob Wainwright für seine ganze geleistete Arbeit in dem letzten Jahrzehnt. Das ist kaum zu unterschätzen, was dort gemacht wurde. Und ich muss auch sagen, wir verlassen uns eigentlich auch alle auf Sie und auf Europol. Und die Bedeutung von Europols wird, glaube ich, zum Teil ähm, überschätzt von dem, was geleistet werden kann. Und da spielt natürlich, spielen die Finanzen eine Rolle. Und ich erwarte natürlich in diesen völlig unsicheren Zeiten, dass wir alle uns anstrengen, um hier mehr Finanzen auch Europol zur Verfügung zu stellen. Und das betrifft natürlich hauptsächlich auch die nationalen Gesetzgeber hier in diesem Fall, aber auch der europäische Gesetzgeber, der hier bereit sein muss, Sicherheit auch tatsächlich ernst zu nehmen. Weil nach meinem eigenen Gefühl ist eine absolute Unsicherheit an der Tagesordnung, nicht nur wenn wir Terrorismus begucken, organisierte Kriminalität, die sich immer weiter ausweitet, darüber hinaus die Cyberattacken, wo wir permanent davon betroffen werden und immer Europa als Opfer sozusagen da sind, da müssen wir mehr tun. Und deshalb auch hier nochmal der Aufruf an alle, auch hier diesen Willen auch entsprechend auszudrücken, dafür was zu tun. Dann ähm, hinsichtlich der Interoperabilität, die angesprochen worden ist, da stelle ich mir natürlich auch die Fragen, ja, das muss strukturell und technisch schon mal gut funktionieren, aber es muss natürlich auch seitens der jeweiligen eingebenden Mitgliedstaaten die Qualität der Daten auch entsprechend sein. Und hier frage ich mich immer, ob man eigentlich auf dieser Ebene auch eine Art gleiche Schreibweise von Namen zum Beispiel auch gewährleisten kann, was, glaube ich, sehr schwierig ist, weil man in Frankreich, Deutschland, Bulgarien zum Beispiel vielleicht bestimmte Namen einfach anders schreibt. Und deshalb braucht man ja dort auch ein Element, um das auch entweder entsprechend weiter entdecken zu können. Dann die nächste Frage ist natürlich, wie kann man in dieser so gearteten föderalen Struktur von Europol ähm, ein vernünftiges System kreieren, was effektiv genug ist. Und da beziehe ich mich auf mein eigenes Land, die wiederum eine föderale Struktur haben und da manchmal schon Probleme äh, haben, auch hier zeigt nah alle Informationen entsprechend auszutauschen. Da frage ich mich, was muss da vielleicht besser werden? Wo müssen wir generell besser werden, wenn es jetzt nicht nur um Geld geht? Und ähm, da wir uns ja zur Cyberkriminalität später noch mal äußern wollen, aber hier vielleicht auch die Frage des, der IT-Fachleute. 
die natürlich durchaus, wenn man sich die großen Tech-Firmen anguckt, ein völlig anderes Gehalt, eine völlig andere Gehaltsstruktur bieten können in der Wirtschaft. Und wie wollen wir eigentlich solche Leute heranziehen, die uns dann eben auch qualitativ so helfen können? Das ist, glaube ich, ein großes Problem, wo wir auch diejenigen, die sich die wunderbar und gut ausgebildet sind, eben auch in eine Behörde wie Europol hineinbekommen. Eine weitere Frage ist hinsichtlich der Geldwäsche. Wir haben mit den USA zusammen das sogenannte TFTP-Programm dort. Wir haben es aber bislang noch nicht geschafft. Vielleicht ist es auch nicht notwendig, ein europäisches TFT-Programm aufzulegen. Da frage ich mich nur, brauchen wir das überhaupt oder reicht uns eigentlich die Zusammenarbeit mit den USA, weil das gut funktioniert? Ähm, nur da, wie gesagt, wäre noch mal wichtig zu wissen, wie können wir uns auch dort verbessern. Die Frage des Datenschutzes, da meine ich oftmals, ähm, dass sowohl nationale, aber auch das Europä also nationale Gesetzgeber, auch das Europäische Parlament es durchaus oftmals überziehen im Datenschutz. Ähm, dort, wo wir eigentlich mehr Sicherheit generieren müssten, müssten wir eigentlich, glaube ich, auch vernünftigere und sehr vielleicht individualisierte Lösungen für Europol irgendwie wir auch bekommen müssen, weil es ansonsten mit allgemeinen grundsätzlichen Datenschutzprinzipien möglicherweise nicht immer so getan ist, Kriminalität so zu bekämpfen, wie es sein müsste. Recht herzlichen Dank. Thank you. And Ms. Wesel from the Netherlands. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marius. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anneke Wezel, representing the Dutch Senate. We thank Bulgari for its hospitality. Um, I thank Mr. Wainwright for his clear presentation and for all the work Europol and Mr. Wainwright have done to combat crime in Europe. Um, Mr. Wainwright told us there are still caps in information exchange. Can Mr. Wainwright specify what he thinks can be improved? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And Maria Grappini from the European Parliament. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I would like to speak in my language. Um, vreau uh, foarte mult să, în calitate de membră a Comisiei Libe, să-i mulțumesc și eu uh, lui Rob și uh, să reamintesc aici pentru Parlamentele Naționale că noi în Comisia Libe am avut foarte multe întâlniri cu conducerea Europol, a primit foarte multe întrebări directe, am primit răspunsuri foarte transparente și vreau să-l felicit pentru traga activitate. Uh, profit de prezența parlamentelor naționale și doresc să spun, și am spus acest lucru și în plenară de multe ori la Strasburg, nu poate fi eficientă nicio agenție europeană dacă nu există cooperare cu țările, statele membre și statele terțe. Dacă vrem să avem o activitate mai bună a Europolului și cu această ocazie vreau să spun că sunt fericită că a fost numită o femeie la conducerea Europol, iată și un balans al egalității de gen și doresc succes, dar dacă vrem să avem pe viitor, pe baza programului prezentat aici o activitate mai bună, este foarte clar că autoritățile naționale, parlamentele naționale, trebuie să înțeleagă și guvernele că e, e, cooperarea cu Europolul nu este așa facultativă. Noi nu putem să scăpăm informații, pentru că dacă mă gândesc la atacul din Belgia, acolo au fost niște scăpări de transmitere de informații și au fost victime omenești. Aș dori să, să spun câteva lucruri pentru viitor. Evident, am avut aici prezentat programul multianual, cred că trebuie să punem accent concomitent pe protecția datelor, dar fără a afecta securitatea. Aici este extrem de important cum inteligent încercăm să protejăm datele cu caracter personal, dar fără a afecta securitatea. Scuzați, eu vreau când mă urc în avion să fiu foarte sigură că lângă mine nu stă un posibil terorist. Uh, și al doilea lucru pe care eu îl cred foarte important este să, pe politica de migrație, noi trebuie să avem foarte clar cum 
rezolvăm politica migrației și e o dezbatere foarte frecventă în Parlamentul European și în Comisia noastră, astfel încât să protejăm populația care migrează, dar fără a afecta securitatea cetățenilor europeni. Este absolut necesar de acest lucru și sper ca noua conducere a Europol să țină cont de experiența lui Rob și să preia și propunerile evident ale grupului de lucru recent creat. Mulțumesc foarte mult! Thank you. Helga Stevens from the European Parliament. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, and good morning to all of you. I'm quite interested in the future uh, and current role of Europol in developing e participation in EU operations and missions and further exploring the potential for deploying staff to delegations, missions, and operations outside the EU. Perhaps uh, Mr. Wainwright could elaborate a little bit about this aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helga. Now, Mr. Sarakiotis from Greece, please. Dear colleagues, uh, terrorists uh, attacks in uh, Europe in, and the eruption of terrorist activity in the MENA region have strengthened our resolve to cooperate at EU level so as to enhance our internal security, cooperation between law enforcement authorities, including with trusted partners, is of utmost importance, especially when it comes to fighting the spread of radicalization, but also illegal migration, illicit trafficking, drugs trafficking, and other forms of organized crime. Having gone through the documents that you have sent us, it's clear that priority has been given to the southern neighborhood countries, which are unfortunately are in the eye of radicalization and migration cyclone. Yet we have a lot to learn from countries such as Israel that have a long experience in the fight against terrorism or Algeria with a long experience in uh, the radicalization. We have a lot to gain from cooperating with the authorities of countries that have a lot to lose from radicalization such as Tunisia whose terrorism industry is often targeted by terrorists. In political terms, EU member states of the South uh, that are in proximity to the MENA region have a role to play in this effort. We have examples of regional cooperation with the participation of EU and non-EU non countries, such as the ministerial conferences for security and stability in the Eastern Mediterranean, an initiative of the Greek Minister of Foreign Affairs aiming to promote cooperation also at the operational level. But looking at the list of priority partners, I have one comment. I was wa wondering why Libya, a country of central importance to issues of terrorism, migrant and drug smuggling, as well as a country of the southern neighborhood, is not on the first priority group. Uh, is it because of the absence of uh, counterparts due to instability in the country, or is there another reasoning behind it? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Ostojic from Croatia, please. Thank you, dear colleagues. First of all, I want to say thank you to Bulgarian presidency and people who are organizing this uh, conference. Second thing is, uh, I am one of the witnesses, you know, who knows exactly how Rob Van Wright was doing his job. And that's why I want to say <laughs> Thank you to Rob, and also I think so that Catherine will continue with uh, progress in this area. Uh, my opinion is, you know, that we are too slow. Uh, the plan is good, paper is nice, but thing is, you know, that we don't have only gaps in exchanging of information. We have more gaps. Ten years ago, I was speaking with Rob, same thing, that last an officer will come to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, as well to Albania. Today, we are hearing, you know, that they will be there. And if we have 10 years to discuss something, 
what is really necessary because 7% of the top criminals are coming from the Western Balkan. It is very easy you know, to understand that we are too slow. And only what I want to say is a message because this is a solution. Accession period for all these countries who wants to come and became the members, full members of European Union is only period when it's possible to make change in this area, to have national contact points, to respect impact priorities, to have liars and officers. And my message is very simple. It is necessary to press them. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm now going to return to, oh, sorry, Mrs. Fatanov, you have a final question. Аз също искам да се присъединя към това, което беше казано до сега и да направим така един цялостен анализ на многогодишното програмиране за 2019-2021. И действително виждаме, че това, което беше казано от Роб Лайнрайт, имаме увеличаване на работата в последните 9 години с 9 пъти. А виждаме, че и в тази многогодишна програма отново имаме увеличаване на обема работа, която трябва да се свърши. Надявам се, че ще има пълно разбиране относно търсенето на допълнителен финансов ресурс за бюджета на Европол, за да може действително да се изпълнат всички тези предизвикателства. За мен е много впечатляващо, че в тази програма има неща, които са свързани с киберпрестъпността. Защото знаем, че това е едно от най-големите предизвикателства и тук искам още веднъж да благодаря за това, че ще бъде и Еврокомисара Кинг и Мария Габриел, които ще говорят по тази тема. Но понеже всеки един от нас говори за споделянето на информация, всеки един говори за това как да увеличаваме възможността на база тази поступваща информация да се прави за дълбоченият анализ на предполагаемите потенциални заплахи за Европейския съюз и как да търсим партньорство извън Европейския съюз. Но аз бих искал да попитам Роб Лайнрайт и ръководство на Европол от една изключително важна тема, която в момента се дискутира в Европейския съюз, и това е Брекзит, излизането на Великобритания от Европейския съюз. Аз мятам, че по темата сигурност ние трябва действително да направим всичко възможно, за да можем да се възползваме и да продължаваме да ползваме един от основните доставчици на информация за Европейския съюз, а това е Великобритания. И в тази посока смятам, че действително трябваше да има и някои акценти, свързани с многогодишното програмиране за 2019-2021, защото не виждам никъде какви са последващите действия от Брекзит. Трябва да ви кажа, че от работата ми и като бивш министр на вътрешни работи и като парламентарист, знам какво е значението и какъв е съществения принос с тази добавена стойност към по-голямата ефективност на държавите членки и действително защита на европейската сигурност. Благодаря. Thank you, Mrs. Fatanov. Um, so, colleagues, before I return to, to Rob for his responses, I should also uh, mention that within the consultation process on the multi-annual work programme, uh, this will continue in Brussels in September, and uh, the co-chairs will send out a letter um, asking for your, your further contributions to the multi-annual work programme. So if you've not had an opportunity to, to contribute today or you would like to further contribute, then please do so in response to that joint letter which will go out. So I now return immediately to Rob for his uh, uh, responses. Rob, please. Thank you, Claude. And firstly, uh, to, to all of you, or many of you, um, uh, Augustin Diaz de Mera and many others who said some very kind things about me. Um, it's always nice to hear it. It's um, slightly uncomfortable hearing uh, people talking about yourself in this way. Uh, I'm a, in the end, I'm, I'm a, a public official, public sector official, not a politician, and also, uh, you know how the British are with their sense of reservedness, but I, I'm, I still very much, I'm very grateful for, for you saying these, these, these kind things. The reality, of course, is that uh, uh, in the end, I'm, I'm a temporary guardian of this, this wonderful institution, and I pass over um, uh, responsibility for it, of course, to Catherine next. And we all do our work, uh, good or bad, uh, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and uh, that's, that's the only uh, story that, that, that is relevant, that uh, 
uh, I work as well as I can and pass it on to somebody else. And my work is only possible thanks to the fantastic men and women of Europol that have support, supported me in this way, some of whom are with me today. Uh, and perhaps even more importantly, the, the support of the network that we've established through the member states and many other countries. And finally, thanks to the political support, which has been so important in bringing Europol into a more frontline position. Um, and the political level uh, in, in, in the EU institutions at the national level have been uh, so important to us. Now, let me go through the questions as, as quickly as I can. We had many questions. Um, uh, Ms. Karamanli uh, asked about uh, the budget. Of course, we have consistently made our request to the budgetary authority, which at the European level is a co-responsibility between the European Parliament and the Council. Uh, so yes, of course, member states also through the European Management Board are aware of our requests. It's consistently supported by the European Management Board. Uh, but at the political level in Council, the story changes. Then, of course, the realities of fixing the EU budget as a whole tend to have the effect of pushing down our demands. And I understand in the budgetary process the, how difficult it is. So this is more a question about, in the end, the ministries of finance in our member states, in the end, having a more decisive final say on this than perhaps the ministers, ministries of, of security and justice. It was also asked by Mr. Sarigotis, Mr. Vesel, many others. Uh, the, the reality is that the, the nature of the internal security threats we face in Europe today, of course, have a global dimension more and more. We have terrorists that are flowing from our region to the Middle East. Uh, the people smuggling problem is inextricably linked to the MENA region uh, especially. Cybercrime cannot be defined in European terms only, and so on, and so on. That pushes Europol naturally, therefore, to establish a global information exchange network. And our legal basis has to adjust to that. But there are uh, very important differences, of course, uh, between our ability to share data within the European Union and outside. And many of you have talked about the importance of maintaining consistently high data protection standards. And this is at the very heart of Europol's integrity and its reputation. We cannot lose that. So when we talk about uh, exchanging personal data uh, with countries around the world, such as Russia and China and many others, then there are obvious challenges about how you can do this to serve the operational requirements of Europol but still meet our data protection demands. And of course, uh, national and European parliaments have invested a lot of time in making sure that we have the right process um, through, uh, in the future, also with the new Europol regulation to conclude international agreements that have a so-called data, data adequacy assessment that are a major part of that. This data adequacy assessment and the new arrangements for concluding international agreements has not yet been tested. So we await, we have a list of priority countries that you see. Uh, we are waiting, though, for the procedure to be finalized and implemented. I don't think we should take so much more time. It's really important that we fill very important, big information gaps. Our gaps at the moment outside Europe are in the immediate region of the European Union. Uh, we still don't have uh, an agreement that can allow us to exchange operational data with Turkey. And that's a number one problem that we have today in terms of our information exchange with partners outside the EU. I could say the same about the MENA region uh, and many other countries um, as, as well. So clearly the challenge for all of us is to fix this in the future. Uh, also a question about the hotspot locations. Yes, we have deployed guest officers so-called. We have recruited some, a pool of some 250 uh, counter-terrorist officers from the member states who on rotation are being deployed to Greece and Italy to help, especially to identify suspicious movements of any terrorists through the migratory flows that are coming through the external border of the European Union. Um, Mr. Metsu asked a very good question about exchange on terrorism. Uh, indeed, only two years ago, 
most of our information was exchanged uh, well, with just five countries, and that was uh, not satisfactory. Uh, we've worked a lot on this. We've put a lot of polite, constructive pressure on the member states. And many political leaders also in, in Parliament have I've talked about the need to, to respond. At the time of the dreadful incidents in Paris and then Brussels uh, over two years ago, it was so-called intelligence share and failures that became part of the narrative. And that has focused the minds of all of us since then. I can tell you there's been a fantastic response from the member states in this field. Two years ago, at the time of the Brussels attacks, uh, we had 6,000 intelligence entries in, uh, in the Europol information system relating to terrorism, 6,000. Today, it's half a million. We've gone from 6,000 to half a million in under two years, thanks to the positive response of, of the member states. Of course, it's still uneven. Of course, it's not all 28 in the same way. It's a lot more than five, though, uh, that, that are today providing uh, a very good level of, of intelligence. We need to still go further, particularly by accessing more directly the work of the counter-terrorist community in the security services and the intelligence. Mr. Diet Mera and, and indeed Mr. Voss talked about the TFTP uh, program. This is indeed has been extremely important uh, in responding to these, the wave of terrorist incidents that we've had in Europe over the last three years. Thousands, indeed tens of thousands of unique intelligence leads have been provided very quickly through this program to the investigators on the ground in Europe to quickly identify those that were responsible for these terrorist incidents. I believe TFTP has been one of the mo most significant pieces of legislation that the EU has introduced in the last 10 years to fight terrorism, without a doubt. And it's true that uh, going forward, we need to adjust that, I think, with an equivalent for the European Union, uh, a so-called terrorist finance and tracking system alongside uh, this. The agreement we have at the moment is essentially a bilateral agreement with the United States. It gives control, finally, in many respects, to the United States. But we are missing a major part of, of the intelligence picture because the current TFTP program excludes the possibility to monitor suspicious terrorist financial transactions within the SEPA region of the European Union. That's a huge area, of course. Um, and whereas we have to apply the maximum possible standards of data privacy and protection, especially to EU citizens, of course, we also know that within our community, we have tens of thousands of radicalized people who are EU citizens, who are responsible for the majority of the terrorist attacks that we've seen in the last three years. And if we cannot monitor also, therefore, terrorist finance movements within that community, then of course it's an intelligence gap. So I, I do believe that TFTES, uh, so-called, should uh, be increased in the future. Dr. also asked about what, what can we do with more capacity, and, and I think this is also what Mr. Marias asked. Um, in the end, on intelligence sharing, it's simply to adjust to the reality of, of how we can have managed just the flow of nine times more data, to, to manage it in a way that still allows us to provide effective operational support. It, with, with such an increase in the flow of data, if we don't have the right resources, we may miss an opportunity to identify a connection to stop a criminal activity, of course, if we're absolutely inundated by the flow. We might inadvertently not continue to apply the highest possible standards of data protection when we have so much quantities to deal with and not enough people to do it. So it, 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 gets, it becomes to the very heart of, of the way that Europol works every day. But to provide a more positive uh, description as well, if we have a better investment in technology. We can transform not just the work of Europol, but how law enforcement sector in Europe can invest in modern technology, like artificial intelligence, in a very dynamic way so that we can have uh, a completely different approach to identifying crime and terrorism in the future. From this will become many more operations. Uh, we have so many requests for an, in, uh, information. There are, for example, on child sexual exploitation, so many requests that we cannot process in time because we don't have the resources. So 
The challenge won't be what will we do with more resources. Um, that's certainly not going to be uh, the first problem of, of, of Europol, I can assure you. Mr. Demetro asked a very interesting, important question about corruption as a priority. Maybe it does not feature strongly enough, I agree, uh, directly in, in, in how we present this. I can tell you, though, that at Europol we see corruption not so much as a, uh, a specific criminal problem, as an enabler of organized crime especially. We see it as a constant feature of how most organized crime works. So, uh, in fact, we are working, therefore, uh, in this area, but as part of many of our investigations where we would certainly investigate any, any leads towards and, uh, corruption. And with that in mind, our work to strengthen and improve the effectiveness of money laundering and the anti-money laundering regime especially is so important. And I've spoken before about how, how this regime has become very ineffective at seizing criminal assets in Europe. And I think this is, should be a major part um, of, of our future. Um, Ms. Cinici asked about the availability of information towards third countries. I think I, I mentioned this under the data adequacy uh, test uh, also. Mr. Voss asked about, made a good point about the importance of the interoperability agenda in Europe. That's true. How can we attract possibly the best people from the technology sector when companies pay far higher rates of, of salary? Well, we do it with a compelling mission that we have. You can work in the private sector, in the tech sector, and do some interesting things, or you can work at Europol and help save lives. And in the end, uh, we find that that is a compelling narrative that is bringing many people into Europol from the police sector, but also uh, from the uh, IT sector as, as well. Ms. Vessel asked about uh, um, gaps in information exchange, which I mentioned already. Can I also, towards her and her colleagues in, in the European Parliament, uh, in fact, pay tribute to the way in which the Netherlands, as a host state, has served Europol so well in providing us with, uh, which is a landmark building for the law enforcement community in Europe for a f uh, for the f uh, as, as a first point, but consistent support from the host state. And all of the institutions of the Netherlands should be applauded for the way in which they have supported uh, Europol over this, this time. Ms. Stevens asked about the integration of Europol in third country missions. Uh, this is such an important area. I talked about the information gap, for example, in the MENA region. Uh, we have some very good opportunities through the EU delegations in these areas, and the idea that we are exploring is that there should be a Europol liaison officer attached to these delegations, to these missions, so that we have better access on the ground. Um, in Libya, we are working with the mission, the EU-BAM Libya, but of course, uh, Libya is, is in a, a very challenging state and there are effectively no uh, partners that we can work with that, that have um, the kind of institutional control of that region at the moment that can help us. In neighboring locations such as Algeria, it's a very different picture and I, I think with Algeria we have a good opportunity to really increase our, our, our capability uh, in, in, in the future. Mr. Ostojic is right. I mean, he has experience of, of, of running a, a police agency. He knows that we have to be dynamic and flexible in responding to these threats, and we are too slow, generally. Um, so as a general point, I, I would agree with that. And finally, Mr. Svetanov asked me a question that um, every journalist asks me these, uh, these days, of course, about, about the impact of Brexit. The only other personal remark I would, I would give is, is that it's with some personal regret that I will be the first but also the last possible British director of Europol. Um, I think uh, Mr. Svetanov is absolutely right that uh, we all should have an interest in making sure that uh, the final negotiations produce an adequate solution on, on security in the future. The dimensions of, of the threats that we're dealing with, I said earlier, are international in nature. The way in which we've responded over the last 30 years collectively, we should be proud of, of the work we have all done. We have built the most cohesive, uh, most well-developed, uh, most mature capability 
to fight on an international basis against crime and terrorism, the best anywhere in the world by a, by a significant margin. We should be pleased uh, with that. Now we have such a coherent environment, uh, of course we don't want that to be fractured or fragmented. So this is a very important element, of course uh, it's for those involved in the formal negotiations uh, uh, to secure that agreement and it's not, it's not right that I comment on the modalities of that um, and it's certainly not right that, that I should be involved in those negotiations, I am not. But Europol has an interest in making sure that the instruments that we have built to make sure we have the best possible security cooperation across Europe will be maintained in the future uh, even after Brexit. I'm actually quite positive about the outcome of that given um, the uh, political comments that have been made by most of the lead actors so far. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sorry for taking so much time, but I hope I've addressed uh, most of the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. On this last question, I know the UK representative here, uh, Clive Soley, Lord Soley, would have wanted to ask that question, so thank you for answering it. Thank you, Chair. Um, and perhaps first, could I start by uh, congratulating everyone on the agreement today, which I think is profoundly important, and on your work, not just here, but over the years. I've known you for many years, and I know how much effort you put into this, and I think you deserve everyone's thanks for it, along with all your colleagues, both in the European Parliament and in the individual parliaments. I think it's very, very important. Um, the question I have, really, is where do we go from here? Um, I think this, uh, the, what's been happening with Europol is a steady and very impressive improvement. And again, many thanks to Rob Wainwright for what he's done on that. You can see the development has had a very real effect on people's lives throughout the European Union and throughout the UK. Um, and I say that, of course, because the UK will be a third country in the relatively near future. That is barring any miracles, and I have to say, uh, sadly, I don't see any miracles occurring. I think we will be a third country. And therefore, we have to think very hard about how we manage the relationship on not just security, but obviously in the context of this conference today, profoundly importantly, on the issue of security and policing. We have to be able to find a way forward on that. I'm reasonably optimistic that Brussels and London will come up with what will likely be an international treaty of some type on, uh, on the exchange of information, Europol, uh, the European arrest warrant, and a group of those issues. It's not easy, but I think that will happen because it's very much in the interest of the UK and very much in the interest of the EU. I think along with that, and what we haven't perhaps done enough thinking about, and any comments on this I would, I would be very pleased to hear, is what sort of institutional structure we'll need to make that work. Because having an in international treaty can be quite rigid and can prevent the flexibility that you need in dealing with issues of this type. And I think we need to give some thought to that. It cannot be done in the context of the negotiations. The negotiations must be separate. And I think uh, both Brussels and London would get very nervous if we all started to pitch in on it. But I do think we have to think beyond this, uh, beyond that uh, point at which Britain is no longer a member of the European Union. And qu uh, questions then, uh, which were touched on before, of adequacy and an equivalence in terms of exchange of information are profoundly important. And I would then put one last point, which is also in the form of a question perhaps for everyone here, is a way in which we can increase can hold on to the very close relationship that there is between the EU countries, the European Union Parliament and the United Kingdom in terms of security and policing. Because if we don't hang on to that, we don't hold on to that structure and make sure we protect it, then people's lives in the UK and the EU will be at risk. And one of the proposals I put forward is that in the longer term, again beyond the negotiations, after Britain has left and become a third country, we have a very close parliamentary link between the European Parliament and the British Parliament. 
In the British Parliament, we already have groups of parliamentarians who link up with individual countries. So we have a Belgian uh, all-party group, we have a German all-party group, we have a Swedish all-party group, an Italian all-party group. And I think we might need to find a way in which we beef those up and make them more effective. And then I think what we haven't got, but we will need, is a strong group of parliamentarians between the European Parliament and the British Parliament. And the reason for this is, uh, is different to some of the other third countries and international organizations and so on. And it is that in all our countries, there is constant and serious debate, to our credit, on the balance between security and civil liberties. And they can affect the, um, uh, uh, the outcome of other discussions. So I think we ought to be discussing that, and any views on that uh, I would very much welcome and would like to hear. And at some time, Claude, sometime in the future, Claude, I might be bending your ear at some, uh, over some period of time to think, take that forward. Many thanks. Thanks. Thank you. I currently work for the European Parliament, but uh, um, I think I think Rob's response. Um, thank you, Clive, for this. I think Rob already kind of responded to the Brexit point. So, um, and thank you, Clive, for that additional um, information, which I think colleagues will appreciate. Um, we're so far ahead of time at the moment that uh, I'm not quite used to it. <laughs> um, we, uh, we, we were going to go to the point with the chairperson of the Europol Management Board at 12 o'clock, but we're, we're well ahead of time, but we're going to just keep, keep going. I'm not so sure about this uh, Bulgarian thing of not having breaks and stuff, but it's, uh, everyone's happy, we keep going. Um, so, um, so we now come to the exchange of views with Mr. Pritt uh, Parkner, the chairperson of the Europol Management Board. Um, and colleagues, in accordance with Article 51 of the Europol Regulation, the Chairperson of the Europol Management Board is invited for this exchange of views. And just as a reminder, um, the debate takes place according to the normal formula, um, as we've had just now. And um, without further ado, I, I will give uh, the floor to, to Pritt for his uh, presentation. and please um, get ready to ask whatever questions you have. And a very warm welcome to him uh, to this meeting. So Mr. Partner, please take the floor. Thank you uh, for the floor. Distinguished members of the JPSG, dear friends and colleagues, it is an honor for me as a chairperson of the European Management Board to address you at this second meeting of the JPSG. I'm very grateful to the head of the delegation of the Parliament of Bulgaria to the JPSG, Mr. Tsetan Tvetanov, and the chair of the European Parliament's Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, Mr. Claude Moraes, their kind invitation. It is a pleasure to be here in Sofia, and I would like to thank the Bulgarian presidency for hosting the meeting in this beautiful city and for the enjoyable dinner and heartwarming folklore performance which we were welcomed yesterday. I would like to say from the outset that the management board of the Europe looks forward to building a successful cooperation with the JPSG. In my speech today, I will focus on specific topics related to Europe's tasks in providing necessary tools for enhancing security and safety in the Europe and beyond such as interoperability, data protection, integrated data management, external st strategy, and others. The presidency of the Council of the EU has chosen to focus in particular on improving the functionalities and interoperability of large-scale IT systems and introducing new ones, optimizing the exchange of information between law enforcement bodies. These priorities are indeed supported by Europe's strategic goals for 2016 to 2020. This is a highly complex endeavor from the technical perspective, as well as a challenging one against the backdrop of limited human and financial resources. Of course, 
besides the Europass capabilities, there are a number of information systems at the EU level that provide national law enforcement agencies with the relevant information on individuals. However, suboptimal functionalities of the existing information system is a still fragmented architecture as well as, as gaps in data management for border control and security. Led to several in initiatives at the EU level that either uh, directly affect Europol or are relevant to its core business. In this context, a reference to the 2017 Commission proposal for a regulation on establishing a framework for interoperability between EU information system is obligatory. In turn, the board is keen on developing a more comprehensive and updated view on information management issues of strategic relevance. The board's aim is to help connect member states and the Europol's process to progressively achieve a duly integrated data management supported by innovative and efficient solutions that guarantee, in parallel, high standards of data protection. Speaking of data protection and without prejudice to the more detailed and expert opinion of the U European Data Protection Supervisor, let me be sure you that the management board at its pa past two meetings discussed the implications that the possible applic applicability to Europol of the revision of Regulation 45-2001 would have on the agency's handling of the operational data. The management board considers it the utmost importance to ensure the continued application of the Reg Europol regulation for operational processing of personal data by the agency, and in this context welcomes and supports the actions taken by Europol and the Bulgarian presidency to ensure this continuity. I was very pleased to see the position that the Mr. Voss from European Parliament expressed in this crucial matter. Let's turn now to the agency's programming document and more particular to its multi-annual component. The multi-annual program is a key instrument which is implemented annually through the corresponding work programs sets out the agency's overall strategic programming, including ob objectives, expected results, and performance indicators, as well as the resources planning, including the multi-annual budget and staff. I submitted to you Europol's draft multi-annual programming 2019-2021. Uh, Therefore, we can say that this is a first full cycle where, in accordance with Article 12 of the European Regulation, that JPSG has been timely consulted. Before its final adoption by the end of this year, the draft program document 2019-21 will be reviewed. The management board looks forward to the possible feedback from the JPSG, to the opinion of the commission, to the possible input from the JHA agencies. Also, we will consider any significant developments of cir uh, circumstances which occurring in 2019 may require adjustments to the year post planning. Speaking of more specific matters to which the management board has devoted continued attention, I should like to mention the reinforcement of Europol's support functions by bringing together its anti-terrorism law enforcement capabilities in the European Counterterrorism Center within the agency. In the area of illegal immigration, to the hotspots approach, Europol contributes through the guest offices mechanism. This means that the Europol deploys law enforcement personnel seconded by the member states' com uh, competent authorities to the hotspots, hotspots established in Greece and Italy. The tasks are support to frontline screening and registration process by reinforcing the secondary security controls. After an experience of approximately one year with the deployment of guest officers, the management board assessed positively the effectiveness, efficiency, coherence, relevance, and the EU added value of the concept and stressed the importance of ensuring the sustainability of the deployment. In this context, we welcome the European Commission's commitment to the continuation of the Europe's guest officer project through amending the budget for 2018. The board looks forward to approving this as soon as possible to avoid the situations 
where the initiative should be downscaled or even halted. The growing number of projects and operational capabilities entrusted to Europol generate a tremendous strain of the agency's budget. Additional resources for the 2018 budget were requested to the budgetary authority, namely the European Parliament and the Council, to take into account Europol's growing tasks. Also, the final budget 2018 experienced an increase compared to that of 2017. It fell short of matching Europol's widening scope of activities. For this reason, Europol presented to, to the last meeting of the Mansion Board the implications of the budgetary shortfall, or in other words, how it would be translated into their prioritizing a number of activities that would have been also necessary to add value to Europol's delivery of products and services. The Management Board expressed concern, emphasized the importance of preserving Europol's core business and activities, particularly in the area of information management, and invited Europol to work with the member states to avoid any determined impact on Europol's core business. I was really pleased to hear Mr. Diaz Nemera uh, and also echoed by Mr. Tsvetano uh, sharing this uh, concern, and thank you for that. I refer to the need uh, to progressively develop the integrated data management concept to ensure interoperability in an increasingly in complex constellation of interrelated systems, and to do both while warranting the highest possible data protection awareness and standards. I have also referred to the board continued focus on the counter terrorism on illegal immigration. Other important files discussed by the management board have been uh, the selection of the future executive director, and I wish to hold here to express the board's appreciation to our outgoing executive director, my friend Ron Wainwright, for his outstanding leadership and the Europol during, uh, in, of the Europol during the last nine years. I was pleased to see how uh, the 8th of the March on a recommendation from the management board and after taking into account the opinion of the Libe committee, the council appointed Ms. Catherine de Bol as the next executive director. As a Europol's primary governing body and stakeholders environment, the management board looks very much forward to the close cooperation with her to ensure that the agency meets the needs and expectations of the member states. Now I will focus the Europol's external strategy for the years 2017 to 2020. As a way of introduction, let me please say that 2017 was a year of important milestones concerning the development of the external strategy. The new Europol regulation has fundamentally transformed Europol's external relations. The Lisbon Treaty transferred the competence for, for the negotiations of international agreements to the Commission acting on behalf of the Union, and foresees the need to obtain the European Parliament's con consent before such agreements may be con uh, concluded by the Council. With the new regulation, Europe is able to exchange non-personal data with any third party, including private parties, where the agency sees it necessary to do so without a need for any underlying agreement. The same is valid for the receipt of the personal data by Europe or from third countries, international organizations, and the EU bodies. The exchange of personal data based on Europe's existing agreements remains valid, and it is also possible, even without the agreement in place, if the Commission has passed the adequacy decision on the level of data protection of any particular third country. There are a number of exp uh, exceptions on this uh, general rule, with the most notable being that the, where the Europol considers on a case-by-case -case basis that the particular transfer is necessary for a series of purposes amongst which the prevention, investigation, detection of, uh, prosec uh, or prosecution of criminal offences, in which case it may transfer the personal data providing it observes some conditions. While the regulation provides for more flexibility for reparation and information exchange on a case-by-case -case basis, it also brings more complexity when it comes to the establishment of systematic cooperation, including the exchange of personal data. 
The global strategy for the European Union's foreign and security policy, the European Agenda on, on Security and the European Agenda on Migration, represent the basis of Europol external, Europol's external strategy for the years 2017 to 2020. We are confronted with a complex and dynamic security threat, which is cross-border in its nature and also goes beyond the EU borders. Europol's external activities are and, and will continue to be driven by operational needs. In particular, they should serve the implementation of actions planned under the European policy cycle. Europol has three main objective, objectives in these external relations. The first one, first one consists uh, in ob uh, optimizing its uh, strategic and operational network uh, of partnerships with a view to ensuring an idle exchange of information, thus strengthening its role as an EU criminal information hub. This is achieved through the con conclusion of strategic and operational partnerships in accordance with Article 23 and 25 of the Euro Europol regulation. The second objective is to strengthen its role as a, a preferred platform for international law enforcement cooperation against threats related to the EU security. This may be done by encouraging and expanding the network of liaison officers attached to Europol, which play a crucial role in facilitating coordinated initiatives against serious crime and terrorism. The number of liaison officers from the third countries within Europol's headquarters increased from 55 in January 2017 to 68 currently. Only from the United States there are more than 30 liaison officers. The continued upgrade of Europol's main communication system, KNOWS as a SENA, or Secure Information Exchange Network application, in 2017, almost 130,000 Siena messages were, were exchanged with the third partners, representing an increase of 35% compared to the previous year. The advancement of the universal message format aimed at establishing the Europol exchange standard for law enforcement authorities to be used in case of system adoption or the development of a new systems. The promotion of the Europol platforms for experts to allow for secure cooperation. In February 2017, there were 61 third country, uh, countries represented on the EPE. Switzerland, Denmark, the United States, Norway, and Canada have each more than 100 members. Australia, Iceland, and Colombia have each more than 50 members. The third objective is to reinforce Europol's position within the EU security architecture in order to address external threats to the security of the EU by strengthening the cooperation with the European Commission and the European Exter External Action Service so as, as to ensure the proper exchange of strategic information and provide a joint analysis of threats of both and its internal and external nature. In doing so, Europol would also assess the potential of a temporary deployment of its staff outside of the EU and fulfill its role in capacity building initiatives. The Malta Declaration, impl uh, Declaration Implementation Plan states the need to enhance information sharing between military and law enforcement capacities deployed in the region, inclu including deconflicting and promoting information exchange and assessing the added value of involving specialized police forces. Europol established the Information Clearing House in order to implement this objective. To ensure proper function, functioning of the Information Clearing House, Europol maintains close cooperation, including temporary deployments and training with the Frontex, Operation Sofia, Aerogen4, and Interpol. A joint management board meeting between Europol and Frontex is planned on the 4th of October 2018. On the 1st of May 2017, the management board endorsed the proposal presented by the Commission to, to play, deploy Europol liaison officers in the Western Balkans and tasked Europol to work closely with the Commission on a pilot deploy, deployment concerning Albania, 
Bosnia Herzegovina and Serbia. At its May uh, 2017 meeting, the management board also adopted guidelines for the Europe's ex external relations, which provide a technical legal framework for the implementation of the regulation in this area. On the 13th of December 2017, the Emerson Board adopted a list of priority partners with which Europol may conclude working arrangements. The list of priority partners reflects the growing need of the Europol to establish cooperation arrangements with countries of, of the MENA region in order to tackle the current, current migratory flows and terrorist threats. The first priority group of the third countries consists of the following eight, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Lebanon, Tunisia, Algeria, and Japan. At its last meeting on the 13th of, the, of February, the board approved the model working arrangement establishing cooperative relations between the law enforcement authorities of third countries and Europe under Article uh, 23.4 of the European regulation. This model shall now be used as a basis for the negotiations with the Europe's future strategic partners. Following the adoption of the model working arrangement and the list of priority partners, Europe has entered the first phase in the process of concluding this type of arrangements, which do not foresee the provision of personal data from, the, uh, from Europol to the third country concerned. Research on the first eight priority countries is being conducted in preparatory for initial meeting with the country representatives. This research focuses on the law enforcement authorities in the respective priority countries with the aim of identifying a central law enforcement authority that could act as a counterpart to a working arrangement with the Europol and would thus present all competent law enforcement authorities in the third country. Europol will formally, will formally initiate the contact process and invite the competent authorities of the first priority group to conclude a working arrangement with the agency. Due to limited resources, it will be, will be a gradual process reflecting the agreed priority order. So far, a preliminary meeting has been held with the representatives of the Japanese National Police Agency and the Japanese delegations to the EU on the 2nd of the March 2018. As you can see, Europol has experienced a number of changes concerning external relations, and we look forward to expanding our influence beyond the EU borders in order to ensure the safety of uh, European Union citizens. In conclusion, I would like to underline that the essence of the Marsh and Board's role is to ensure that the Europol provides a con uh, continuously enhanced support to the law enforcement competent authorities of the member states, a support that effectively reflects their operational needs and expectations. We see the JPG, JPSG as our partner in the common challenge of ensuring governance stability uh, consistency and continuity for Europol in a rapidly changing operational environment. I thank you very much for your attention. Remain available in case you wish to format any question and look forward to welcome, welcoming the JPSC representatives at the management board meeting to be held here in Sofia on the 3rd of the May 2018. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Partner. Before we go to the um, Members, I notice uh, Commissioner King has arrived. I'd like to warmly welcome him and, of course, um, welcome uh, Commissioner Gabriel, who I didn't properly welcome at the beginning, so welcome them both. Um, and they will, of course, be speaking in the session after lunchtime. Um, as we're so far ahead of time, just to mention also, colleagues, that we'll obviously just be taking an earlier lunch, and Mr. Svetanov will mention when that happens. I'm going to now hand over to him to manage the, um, the speakers list. Mr. Svetanov. I also want to welcome the Euro Commissar Ken Koic, who is the president of today's format and debate that we will lead together with Maria Gabriel. And of course, we will start with the announcements that were made. I will give the word to Josep Maria Terik 
Кабрас от Европейския парламент. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Pagner, for your presentation. Well, with a view of the upcoming set of recommendations from the European Commission to the Council on the opening of negotiations for agreements between the EU and various countries of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, North Africa, Algeria, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Tunisia, Turkey. Uh, I would like to ask, do you know, or do you know that anyone knows if it is envisaged that this agreement between EU and those countries will contain provisions that will enable Europol to determine when information supplied by Israel stems from activities of Israel's authorities in uh, by Israel occupied territories and the other way around. Is it envisaged that the agreement will contain provisions covering the supply and request of information from Israel by Europol that will enable Europol to request information stemming from activities of Israel's authorities in the occupied territories? I think this is not a minor question if we want that Europol becomes a true defender and a reference for human rights. Thank you. Благодаря. Нека да групираме трите изявени изказвания. Давам думата на барон Клайв Солей от камерата на лордовете на Великобритания. Thank you. I don't think I need add or say any more than what I did a few moments ago, um, other than to say, obviously, same question in a sense, please do think about the situation post-Brexit and how we handle the institutional problems arising from that. Thank you. Благодаря си. Последният заявил за изказване, това е Марк Ангел, Люксембург. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Parkner, for this update on the external, uh, Europol's external strategy. My three questions deal with a better integration of Europol's position into the European security architecture. And um, one aspect is the cooperation with EU operation and missions, which you already mentioned and which was mentioned in the session before. Uh, you gave some specific examples. So what are the lessons learned from these examples? And, and you said that you will enhance this cooperation. So what will this enhancement be? And second, I, you mentioned also capacity building, and I believe very much in capacity building because it's important to assist our partners' uh, uh, capacities and fostering their resilience. So, but I read in the documents we were provided that this capacity building of Europol will remain very limited. So I guess the reasons are financial resources or other reasons human uh, resources. And um, a third question is when I see the priority list, the countries, the first list and the second list, I see an important number of countries missing. For example, the G5 Sahel countries. These countries are, uh, uh, the European Union has a lot of uh, missions there and there's a lot of development going on there. And here we are very close to the nexus of security and development. And I was wondering why the, G G uh, the G5 Sahel countries are not on the priority, first priority or second, at least at the second priority list. Thank you very much. Господин Партнер, заповядайте. Thank you for those questions. Uh, um, I think uh, the first question concerning the Israel and the relations with, uh, uh, I think, and I definitely hope that uh, everything is done uh, uh, under by the highest uh, standards of our data protection. But I think uh, somehow we have to also understand that uh, cooperation between uh, Europol and the third countries and also how it's uh, different uh, information is provided. It's also the responsibility for the, each country uh, itself. 
And uh, as it was mentioned also in my speech that uh, we are trying, or Europol is trying to find the appropriate uh, agency which provides the general information in, in, in all the country. So we, we just uh, have to um, do our best to find this one. And uh, I think uh, what concerns the Luxembourg's uh, question, uh, uh, which was brought by Mark uh, Angel, uh, I think um, you asked a very uh, exact, uh, how to say, um, examples or a very good practice in this area. I think it's much more appropriate to give the examples by the Europol, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that also uh, uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, those one uh, uh, in in the Europol. Uh, I think it's much more easy to address these questions to the Europol because they have, uh, in operational level, uh, much more knowledge than the Marshall Port. And um, what concerns the Brexit, um, uh, I think uh, the Brexit issue will be also uh, on the Marshall Port uh, table. Uh, mm, but I, I think it will be in, in something uh, next of the year or end of this year. Yeah, thank you. So colleagues, uh, we move now to the final panel before lunch and the family photo. And this is on the exchange of views with Giovanni Buttarelli, the European Data Protection Supervisor. Um, and we are going to get a, a video intervention by Mr. Buttarelli. Um, and also with us today, you'll have noticed we have Mr. Via Vierovsky, the Assistant European Data Protection Supervisor, who will speak, of course, following the video intervention. So um, if we're ready for the video intervention from Mr. Buttarelli, uh, we can have this if we're ready. Honourable members of the European uh, Parliament, honourable members of the national parliaments, uh, it is a duty but also my sincere pleasure to appear again before the joint parliamentary scrutiny group, although remotely. As you know, we only started our role as Europol's data protection supervisory body in May last year. After almost one year, Europol uh, supervision uh, remains a core business in the context of the broader EDPS mission. In fact, our supervision on Europol constitutes a specific chapter of our annual report of, for 2017, which will be presented tomorrow at the Libre Committee of the European Parliament here in uh, Brussels. This event is uh, one of the reasons which impeded my participation in person today. I sincerely regret not being with you at this meeting, which I'm sure is going to be a fruitful and successful one. We believe that the joint parliamentary scrutiny group may play an essential role in politically monitoring Europol's activities. I'm not only referring to the fulfillment of the Europol's mission, but also to its activities impact on fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals. I'm also confident that this group after its start-up phase could also contribute to stimulate a more comprehensive debate on EU policy and, and their implementation in the area of freedom, security and justice. I greatly appreciated the tone and the content of the first constituent meeting in October last year. On that occasion I briefly described the new EDPS approach to Europol uh, supervision and we steadily focus on the key concept of first accountability and then cooperation with national supervisory authorities, not speaking about an innovative approach. And we have been building precisely upon these three cornerstones. Uh, throughout this first year, our supervision has been a substantial exercise. In addition to the handling of complaints and consultations, we conducted our first inspection in December last year. A second one is in the pipeline. We acted and intend to audit Europol together with experts from the National Supervisory Authority so as to build on the previous experience we shared 
with them within the former joint supervisory body. Its legacy, let me tell you, is in very good hands. We ensured continuity and evolution with the JSB mission by focusing also on uh, special categories of persons, sensitive data, data review, and also data retention. And further down the line, we aim to obtain improved auditability while not uh, stifling innovation in the intelligent products and processes. We are committed to further developing data mapping and a fine-tuned methodology for data protection risk assessment that will accompany Europol's prior consultation request to my institution, DDPS. Working in tandem with the Europol's data protection function as being and is key in that respect, developing new technologies so as to keep the pace with new challenges of the different forms of crime is also key to Europol. And our supervision aims to ensure that this technological dimension is properly balanced with the need of having high standards of security and data protection for the individuals. The extent of our efforts over Europol remain, however, dependent on the related legal framework. I've been repeatedly calling for a speedy adoption of the new regulation for the EU institutions and bodies so that it would be applicable on the 25th of May at the same time as GDPR. This timing now appears as difficult to be respected. However, a swift adoption of this regulation remains, in my view, key if the law wants to contribute to the consistency and harmonization of data protection framework across the EU. The new proposed regulation would encompass both administrative and so-called operational data. The EU legislators are in the last mile of an intense exchange of views on whether or not we should have a sole and only data protection regime applicable for EU institutions. As reiterated in many EDPS opinions, we welcome initiatives which seek to introduce more coherence and consistency in this area, along with a limited number of justified and specific provisions related to the so-called operational data processed by EU law enforcement bodies. We continue to support the principle of one law for all EU institutions and bodies, especially for administrative data, subject to coherent specific rules applying to certain core business law enforcement activities. Indeed, we should not overlook the increased interaction in the form of exchange of information and personal data between police and justice institutional actors and those having administrative tasks. This trend would call for a reductio ad unitatem of the data protection rules under the umbrella of the EDPS supervision. The main and almost the only significant problem concerns the subset of the so-called operational data process by, in particular, Europol, but also Eurojust and EPO, I mentioned it, uh, above. And this is certainly a point of uh, strategic importance. I hope that the co-legislators will soon, in the next few weeks, find a sound and balanced solution of this uh, challenging but essential piece of, uh, of legislation. What does the future hold for our supervision on, uh, on Europol? Um, first of all, we need to think and act coherently. The EDPS is advisor to the EU legislator and supervisory authorities of all EU institutions and, and bodies. We have an ideal position in connecting the dots and in identifying problems and challenges of common concerns to Europol and large-scale information systems. We are keen to develop this area of supervision on which so far we have constructively been working together with the national supervisory authorities. And international transfers from Europol to third countries and international uh, organizations uh, remain an area of paramount importance to which we continue to develop deep attention as confirmed by the opinion I adopted on March 14 this year on the eighth negotiating mandates to conclude international agreements allowing the exchange of data between Europol and, uh, and third countries. Let me 
conclude by paying tribute uh, to the executive director of Europol, Rob Wainwright, and to his deep commitment to, to data protection. As uh, Mr. Wainwright recently wrote, data protection is uh, an opportunity to improve internal business process and enhance external level of trust. And this is also the way we work together, trustfully and fruitfully. I will give the floor now to my good colleague Wojciech Wieworoski, uh, Assistant Supervisor at DDPS, who will further detail uh, our supervision uh, role on Europol and may reply to your questions on, uh, on the spot. Let me wish you all an engaging and fruitful uh, discussion and thank you for your attention. It's the concept of remote chairing. This is uh, good controlling. So please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, that's a great pleasure for me to take part in this uh, meeting today in Sofia and uh, at the same time to pay the tribute to the work uh, which is done by the national parliament and the European parliament in the supervision of uh, uh, Europol and uh, the activities of the, um, of the agency. Uh, that's also the very good moment to say uh, my thanks uh, to Rob Wainwright and his uh, uh, managers in uh, Europol uh, for the fruitful cooperation of uh, last year. Let me just add a few uh, practical things uh, to what has been said by Giovanni uh, Buttarelli as the uh, summary of this uh, almost a year of the supervision over Europol as far as the operational data is concerned and the uh, core activities of Europol are concerned. Because we have to remember that EDPS, uh, uh, as the supervision uh, institution of the European Union, had already had some supervision over Europol as far as the uh, data of the staff is con uh, concerned and the internal solutions for the uh, activities. Uh, De definitely, we can say about three main parts of our activities that we did. Uh, first of all, this is the opening or opinioning of different kind of uh, uh, guidelines, different kind of uh, uh, internal uh, documents uh, that are prepared uh, inside Europol, as well as opinioning of the uh, cooperation of uh, Europol with, uh, for, with third parties, uh, th third countries' uh, authorities. The second part is the everyday cooperation with the staff and the management of the institution, which is mostly done by the case officers in EDPS, uh, together with the, uh, to, to the with, together with the corresponding uh, uh, staff of the Europol. But uh, sometimes we also uh, um, supplement it uh, with the uh, everyday consultation between the management of uh, Europol and uh, EDPS uh, supervisors. And the third part of this uh, are the inspections. And uh, the detailed information on what happened uh, so far, as far as these three topics are concerned, is uh, uh, included in the document which has been distributed to you during this meeting and which is a part of the annual report of the European Data Protection Supervisor that is going to be presented to the Libe Committee uh, tomorrow. We also distributed some of our opinions and uh, uh, we are uh, ready to provide you with uh, additional information about the practical, especially technical solutions and technical uh, details uh, of uh, our inspection work. Uh, we have to remember that, as it was said before by, by representatives of Europol, the main problem, the main uh, challenge for now and for the future is the development of the new technological tools uh, for the activity of Europol as a kind of hub, information hub, uh, uh, that should facilitate exchange of information between the police authorities and police uh, forces inside the European Union. And uh, definitely Europol information system is uh, here, the, uh, the place here, the um, most important role as well as Siena, but as well also as this uh, uh, Europol platform uh, for uh, experts, uh, which uh, Rob Wainwright was uh, telling about uh, in, in, the, in the past. Uh, the big uh, challenge for us uh, is the introduction of the interoperability scams uh, inside the European Union as far as interoperability between the large-scale information system is concerned. 
and uh, we are starting the proposal from the uh, Commission and uh, we uh, also are, are taking part uh, in the consultation in this field, uh, knowing that Europol, together with some other agencies, will become a kind of hub for these uh, in, uh, interoperable solutions uh, that exist and that will exist in the nearest future. Uh, I also would like to uh, point uh, the very a uh, nice and open attitude uh, uh, inside Europol towards the supervision. Uh, I also will recall the blog post uh, that was done by Rob Wainwright for the European Data Protection Day in the end of January when he said about his enthusiasm uh, for data protection that was uh, developing throughout his uh, work in the uh, Europol. Even if these words are because of the European Data Protection Day, it's really nice to, to hear that uh, uh, for the representative of the law enforcement authorities, uh, uh, the data protection is simply the part of the normal activity and the part of the uh, secure environment uh, for the uh, no normal operation. We were always of the opinion that uh, introduction of the new techniques, uh, new tools, uh, new uh, technological solutions in the work of the law enforcement authorities uh, uh, in Europe is uh, the must be. It's also uh, the uh, natural development uh, in the history and we are not going to stop it in any, how, in any way. Uh, we only think about having it civilized and having it uh, uh, done in, comp uh, in uh, uh, respecting, respecting the uh, human rights and the fundamental rights uh, uh, that are observed in the European Union. I'm uh, ready to answer the questions if there are any uh, about the supervision of Europol. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There are four and we start immediately with Mr. Peterson from the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, first of all, let me say that um, I think it's extremely important that we, in this scrutiny group, have the opportunity to uh, discuss with the uh, EDPS. Uh, uh, as data protection is such a key issue in the new regulation, it makes a lot of sense that we have this opportunity, and I, I really think it's of, uh, of major importance. Now, um, uh, my, my question relates to uh, the conclusion of international agreements uh, uh, between Europol and third countries. Um, and um, uh, I, I think it's, it's very important to, to ask the EDPS on this issue uh, as well and, and hearing the reflections are from the EDPS on this because uh, when concluding agreements with third countries, it is important that we have the appropriate measures to uh, protect personal data when cooperating with third countries. And, and my question uh, to you would be, in your opinion, do we have the appropriate safeguards in place, uh, ensuring that this takes place in, in an orderly manner? Because uh, clearly the EDPS has also been somewhat critical on, on, on concluding these agreements. So uh, if you would please elaborate a little further whether uh, we basically have the right safeguards uh, in place, and if not, uh, what do we do about it? Uh, because to me, this seems of vital importance given the importance of, of data, data protection, and, and, and concluding, uh, obviously, agreements also with, uh, with third countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Coralie de Bost of the French National Assembly, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, ma question rejoint uh, celle de mon collègue uh, Petersen qui a été posée à l'instant. Effectivement, sur le volet stratégique numéro 2, comme cela a déjà été évoqué, Europol négocie des accords avec les États tiers, comme la Turquie ou l'Égypte notamment, sur l'échange de données personnelles en vue de lutter contre le terrorisme ou le trafic de migrants, mais aussi pour lutter contre le trafic d'armes ou la contrefaçon de marchandises. Est-ce qu'il vous serait possible de nous préciser le rôle respectif joué par les services de la Commission et par la direction d'Europol pour mener ces négociations Les objectifs relevés sont suffisamment larges et ne se limitent pas aux formes les plus graves de criminalité ou de terrorisme, mais ont aussi une finalité économique. Donc première question, pourquoi avoir un champ aussi large Ensuite, sur la méthode, est-ce que vous pouvez nous confirmer que ces accords pour être validés devront bien être adoptés par le Conseil de l'Union à la majorité qualifiée après approbation du Parlement européen. Nous nous interrogeons en effet sur la manière dont les États membres qui restent propriétaires des informations qu'ils transmettent à Europol pourront s'opposer à ce que certaines informations fassent l'objet d'échanges avec des États tiers dont ils estiment qu'ils ne présentent pas tout à fait toutes les garanties de respect de l'État de droit. 
Notamment, il paraît un peu théorique de prévoir dans le mandat de négociation avec la Turquie que, je cite, « Plusieurs autorités publiques indépendantes chargées de la protection des données auront à surveiller l'usage fait par la Turquie des données personnelles et devront veiller à ce que la Turquie ne transmette pas à des pays tiers non autorisés ces mêmes données. » N'est-il pas un petit peu illusoire de penser qu'une autorité indépendante non turque pourra mener des investigations en Turquie et sera en mesure de recueillir les plaintes des personnes sur l'utilisation abusive des données personnelles les concernant de manière plus générale, la Commission européenne ne risquerait-elle pas d'aller trop loin dans son souci sécuritaire en cherchant à renforcer la coopération policière avec des États qui ne partagent en rien le respect de nos valeurs démocratiques Je vous remercie. Thank you, Mr. Elias Mariantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is something similar to the previous question. Regarding the drafting of agreement with a number of Mediterranean countries that will provide access to personal data, we must point out that a differentiated approach toward each country must be potential in view of its particular political context. There are all particular concerns regarding exchange of personal data, for example, with Turkey, not least in the context of the continuing state of emergency in the country and the outgoing range of critical individual. How will it be possible to ensure that such an agreement will not become a tool of political pass in the hand of impressive region? Thank you. Thank you. And finally, from the European Parliament, Mr. Axel Voss, please. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Um, ich glaube, jedem von uns, also, <laughs> erst noch warten. Jedem von uns ähm, ist eigentlich klar, wie wichtig gerade in der technologischen Welt Datenschutz und Privatsphäre auch ist. Und deshalb ist, glaube ich, hier die richtige Balance hinsichtlich des Datenschutzes auch wirklich vernünftig. Was ich eigentlich nur kritisiere, was der europäische Gesetzgeber, aber möglicherweise auch die nationalen Gesetzgeber immer machen, ähm, dass wir an den alten Strukturen und an den alten Prinzipien irgendwie immer festhalten, ohne die Besonderheiten eigentlich dieser neuen digitalen, des, dieses neuen digitalen Zeitalters im Grunde ausreichend oder eben nicht richtig berücksichtigen. Und wir wollen doch eigentlich beides, Sicherheit und eben dann auch die, den Schutz der Grundrechte bzw dann den Datenschutz im Besonderen. Nur wie wirkt sich das jetzt hier aus im Sicherheitsbereich? Das ist meine Frage. Funktionieren eigentlich die Strukturen? Das wäre eigentlich auch eine Frage an den Rob Wainwright hier nochmal. Funktioniert eigentlich dieser Austausch von Daten auch bezüglich des Datenschutzes und müssen wir da vielleicht schneller werden? Welche Hürden gibt es da eigentlich? Ist die Bürokratie zu überbordend mit dem, was wir dort bislang verabschiedet haben? Ist all das möglich, was wir eigentlich für Sicherheit brauchen? Oder gibt es hier bestimmte Dinge in diesem Bereich des Datenschutzes, was man dann irgendwie nicht machen kann. Deshalb, ich glaube, wir erzeugen, und das kam auch gerade bei den Beiträgen der Kollegin aus Frankreich und aus dem Kollegen von Zypern auch noch mal raus, eine gewisse Unsicherheit, wenn es in der Sicherheitskooperation mit Drittstaaten geht. Und ich glaube, auch da bräuchten wir irgendwie Möglichkeiten, weil man nicht immer davon ausgehen kann, dass das Datenschutzniveau Europas auch in diesen Drittstaaten irgendwie so vorhanden ist. Aber wir brauchen dennoch die Zusammenarbeit dazu. Deshalb auch hier im Grunde die Frage, kann denn ich sage mal, im, im Sinne eines, einer, einer Dienstleistung oder um vermitteln tätig zu werden, um hier auch Flexibilität zu erzeugen, der Daten, europäische Datenschutzbeauftragte in diesem Bereich auch Lösungen vielleicht anbieten, einen innovativen Ansatz bieten, um 
die Vorgehensweisen, die man braucht, auch trotz des Datenschutzes irgendwie hinzubekommen. Ich glaube, das muss möglich sein, dass wir gerade was Sicherheit betrifft hier etwas innovativer vielleicht auch werden, um das hinzubekommen. Eine letzte Frage noch. Wir haben natürlich im Trilog gerade zu der Richtlinie 45 2001, wo es um den Datenschutz der europäischen Agenturen auch geht, ein bisschen eine Blockadesituation zwischen Rat und Parlament, wo es um die, gerade um die operativen Daten und das Behandeln von administrativen Daten entsprechend geht, nicht nur bei Europol, bei Eurojust ja genauso. Auch hier wäre es vielleicht schön, den, dem Wunsch der Sicherheitsbehörden, bestimmte Maßnahmen ergreifen zu können oder bestimmte Grenzen einzuziehen, auch hier sozusagen etwas anbieten zu können, dass am Ende jeder damit zufrieden ist, aber insbesondere die Sicherheitsbehörden auch damit arbeiten können. Und da, glaube ich, muss man darauf achten und da sehe ich ein bisschen den europäischen Datenschutzbeauftragten als Vermittler zwischen diesen Positionen als denjenigen an, der dort Lösungen anbieten kann. Und da wollte ich nur mal nachfragen, ob es da nicht möglich ist, vielleicht diesen Schritt noch weiter zu gehen, um eben dort Sicherheit zu gewährleisten auf der einen Seite und den Datenschutz eigentlich nicht zu vernachlässigen. Meines Erachtens, das haben wir so ein bisschen verpasst in der Datenschutzgrundverordnung, neue Datenkategorien einzuziehen, eine Möglichkeit, wo man eben dann tatsächlich mit personenbezogenen Daten viel leichter umgehen kann, aber gleichzeitig sie dennoch geschützt sind. Vielleicht gibt es hier so etwas Ähnliches, dass man mal versucht, über solche neuen Datenkategorien nachzudenken, um eben auch hier Sicherheit besser gewährleisten zu können über die Analyse von Daten. Okay, thank you, Axel. Now we return to Mr. Vierowski for some responses, please. Uh, thank you very much for these questions. Uh, uh, let me answer these uh, first three questions uh, somehow together with all the uh, details uh, that uh, were asked by the uh, parliamentarians. Uh, well, definitely, as I said, the uh, exchange of data with the third countries uh, is one of the main challenges for the future. We have to remember that uh, the uh, our discussion about exchanging data with the third countries does not mean only that Europol is going to provide the third countries with the data which is stored on the European side. Actually, the main reason for doing that is to get the data on the, uh, the other way, so to get the data from the third countries into the uh, European Union. And uh, we know that uh, in all kinds of agreements like that, uh, the famous word reciprocity is uh, the key to the whole deal and to the whole negotiations uh, that we are doing uh, uh, with the third countries. In the data protection world, uh, when we start to think about the exchange data of data with the third countries, we usually mean United States, we usually mean the big players like uh, India, the big players like Japan, but we are forgetting the fact uh, that the European Union countries are bordering uh, with the third countries. And if you look at the eastern part of Europe, uh, you will find out how many neighbors do we have uh, and how many uh, relations then we have between the countries like Finland, uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and etc but also Bulgaria, also Romania, also Slovenia, and the third countries like Bosnia-Herzegovina, like Montenegro, uh, like Serbia, like Belarus, like uh, Russia. These are very different countries. Some of them are taking a lot of efforts in order to meet the standards of the European Union, like Serbia does, like Montenegro does. Some of them are not doing almost anything like Belarus. Uh, some of them have different ways of protecting the data, like Russia. It starts to be the same in the Mediterranean region. So we have very different countries, one from another. So it is true that uh, a little bit more individual approach should be taken. Because we have a country like Israel, which is an adequate country. There is an adequate decision on adequacy about uh, Israel. Uh, 
that has been taken under the directive uh, that existed so far, but it's still valid. Then we have the countries which do quite a lot as far as data protection is concerned, like Morocco, but we have also the countries uh, that were described here where the situation is much more difficult, uh, and uh, all of them are the possible, uh, the possible uh, third parties to negotiate with. So the whole opinion that the European Data Protection Supervisor gave to the uh, proposal of the agreement uh, uh, to be created with these third countries uh, has many reservations, but it's not saying no to the exchange as such, because this is the not the new phenomenon. Most of the countries uh, that uh, the uh, participants of today's meeting are coming from have the same agreements like that with the third countries on the level of the country, on the level of the member state. And as it is uh, with the European Data Protection Supervisor for the European agreements, uh, there was the Data Protection Authority on the national level who was involved uh, in opinioning process uh, for these kinds of agreements on the national level. That is also the place where the national uh, parliaments can play a vital role in showing how you can uh, secure the data, how you can uh, limit the way they are used uh, if the agreement like that is, con uh, is created. Because this tradition of the agreements like that uh, is not only for the last few years, this is the uh, tradition that we have uh, already for the whole time the data protection law exists uh, in, the, uh, in the European Union uh, countries. So this cooperation is uh, vital in the group that we are taking part in today, but also in the cooperation work that the data protection authorities uh, do. Uh, you can see in the opinion that was uh, uh, signed by Mr. Buttarelli on 14th of March this year, that's the part of the documents that we delivered today, that uh, points 4, especially 4, 1, 4, 2, and 4, 3, are actually touching this problem. So the problem of purpose limitation, the problem of onward transfers between the authorities inside the country, and uh, the special restriction or specific restrictions uh, to be added uh, to the solutions which are proposed right now. This is what the EDPS is pointing its finger on. But of course, there was a very, I think the most important question that was asked uh, was the one about the effectiveness of the possible supervision of what's going on in these countries. And here, once again, I have to say that there are significant differences between the countries. Because in Israel, whatever would be the opinion about the authorities in Israel, there is a well-established and well-working data protection authority that there is a long uh, tradition of cooperation with, uh, and who is, for example, the member of the uh, Global Privacy Enforcement Network, uh, which is the unofficial uh, forum for cooperation of data protection authorities, uh, also on the global level exactly in the enforcement of uh, data protection. We have Turkey with the new data protection law, which is quite different from the developments that we have in Europe. And uh, finally, we have the countries where there is no typical data protection law and no authority to, to uh, cooperate with. So I'm sorry to say that uh, in the future, EDPS will be one of these institutions that will say about the fundamentals we have to remember about, uh, and will ask the questions, is it the same situation in all these countries, uh, and uh, what can be mistakes to be done? On one hand, we would love to have case-by-case -case analysis uh, by Europol of all the cases that, uh, where the information is exchanged. On the other hand, we, I would agree with Mr. Voss saying that uh, we have to create the system which is less bureaucratic uh, and which is uh, simply faster and efficient. But we have to remember that there were very bad examples in the past uh, in passing the data from the, exec from the uh, uh, law enforcement authorities uh, to the third countries, uh, like for example tax data that was sent to Belarus uh, and then we used in order to oppress the democratic opposition in this country. So there, there has to be a kind of balance between case-by-case -case approach, which I would always uh, stand for, and the efficiency 
of the data protection, uh, of the, uh, sorry, of the uh, law enforcement authorities. And this is the main point uh, that uh, we will be dealing with. And finally, there was a, there was a question about the trialogue uh, on the new regulation that would exchange uh, regulation 45-2001. I have to say I'm in a very delicate situation because this is not the role of the European Data Protection Supervisor <coughs> to say what should be the political solutions taken in the trialogue. As it was said by Giovanni Buttarelli, we are definitely in favor of having reductio at unitatem and having one system applying to all the institutions, bodies and agencies in the European Union. On the other hand, we would be very uh, keen on keeping all the good solutions uh, that exist right now in the European law. And we think that the uh, regulation on Europol has several solutions which are really the ones to be followed uh, in the other institutions. So in this sense, uh, we, we would like to have the solution of the problems we have uh, uh, as soon as possible. And uh, th at the same time, it's hard for me to advise more uh, at the time the trial log is done. I guess I addressed uh, uh, all the main issues that were in the questions. Uh, maybe one, one, more, uh, one more thing about the old principles being used in the new technologies and being used in the world of the big data. Uh, well, I know these principles of uh, data protection seems to be old but they were discussed again and again and again, also in the whole process of the reform of the data protection law. And even if at the time of the big data, we have the problem with the principle of minimization or the principle of uh, purpose limitation, which for those who are dealing with big data are um, ununderstandable anymore, uh, I have to say that the recent information about what was going on in the activities of Cambridge Analytica for the uh, pur purposes of the uh, political reuse of the data shows that the purpose limitation and the minimization of the data is uh, one of the key principles that we have to be uh, stick to. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, colleagues, we made it. We made it. Um to the lunchtime and the family photo without a break. So thank you very much for your stamina and um, attention. Um, and we've got a very interesting afternoon to look forward to, a very interesting uh, debate uh, then. And I'm going to now ask my co-chair, Mrs. Fatanov, uh, to conclude this morning and give you some information. Skipi Gosti. От добре свършената работа си гарантирахме малко по-дълга обедна почивка и мога да кажа, че обяда както беше планиран за 13.15, обяда ще започне в 12.30 до 14.15. 14.15 ще направим фамилната снимка, за която каза и господин Мораес и от 14.30 започваме да се движим по продължение на дневния ред от днешното съвместно заседание. Обяда е на горния таж, осмия таж. От тук много лесно ще ни опътят асистентите, които са тук. И пожелавам един приятен обяд и след обедна добра работна среща. За общата снимка ще помоля всички да бъдем в 14.15, за да може действително да направим това, което е важно от всяко едно такова съвместно мероприятие. Благодаря ви.